Okay, so let, let's start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session for this uh, PhD defense. Uh, my name is Emilio Martinez Nunez from University of Santiago de Compostela. And I'm going to chair this uh, examination committee of uh, this PhD. Let me first of all to introduce everybody here. So the, the PhD candidate is Gustavo Cárdenas and then the, uh, the rest of the members of the committee. So jo joining here at uh, the table is uh, Inés Corral from Universidad Autónoma de Madrid and Cristina García Iriepa from Universidad Alcalá de Henares. And un unfortunately, the other two members uh, could not be present here because they, they are sick but they are following us uh, via Zoom, and they are um, Basil uh, Kuchot from the University of Bristol and Elise Dumont from uh, Université de Lyon. So I guess without any further ado, we now give the floor to uh, Gustavo Cárdenas uh, for the presentation. We are now going to move there to, to see the presentation. Gustavo. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, well thank you all for being present today for this uh, PhD uh, thesis defense, and thank you also Emilio for the nice presentation. And so, yeah, um, my name is uh, Gustavo Cardenas, and uh, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the things that uh, we have been working on throughout these uh, three years of PhD thesis uh, here at the Autonomous University of Madrid. So uh, my PhD uh, work consisted of uh, the modeling of the interactions between anti-cancer compounds and uh, either uh, uh, DNA or uh, lipid membrane. So I would first of all like to uh, start with uh, considering the systems under study in this present work and also the situation we, we, we are studying. So suppose that this is a model, a very, very simplified model of an, a, a carcinogenic cell. And suppose now that we have nearby a anti-carcinogenic drug uh, over here. So of course here there could happen several things, but we're just going to consider two of them for simplicity, and because those were the both that we considered. So first of all, the drug could enter the lipid bilayer and sit there and trigger its anti-cancer activity. Uh, alternatively, the drug could enter all the way across the membrane uh, inside the, the cell and eventually react, for example, with uh, DNA present in the cell. So here I'm going to subdivide the systems I'm, I'm considering depending on, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, their, their way of, of action, the mechanism. So there are some uh, molecules that are active in the ground state. Specifically, uh, the molecule that we studied was the cisplatin molecule. So this is the ground electronic state. Alternatively, we also studied uh, molecules that are active only at some electronic excited state in particular the anthracnone molecule and some of its derivatives. So let's consider a little bit uh, it, their mechanism of action. So we have first uh, the cisplatin molecule. Now, in this case, well, as, as you saw before, 
uh, we have uh, well, the permeation of the cisplatin inside the lipid membrane. And afterwards, the cisplatin molecule loses these, these two chlorine uh, ligands and binds to two nucleobases of DNA, uh, causing a distortion of DNA that ultimately triggers, let's say, apoptosis, which is basically the program cell death. In the second case, we have the anthraquinone and the uh, derivatives. So in all these cases, these molecules could either uh, react with uh, the molecules of the uh, cellular lipid bilayer, or they could also uh, enter and uh, interact with DNA, ultimately causing DNA damage. Now, in this later case, well, here we have a, a representation of the different potential energy surfaces of of the different well, the ground state and the electronic excited states. Now, what could, which needs to happen here is that first of all, anthraquinone needs to be photo excited towards well, the, the singlet manifold. And afterwards, it undergoes intersystem crossing towards the triplet state. So it is this triplet state, the one that is active uh, and could trigger, for example, either charge transfer or electron transfer reactions. So we're gonna, we're gonna consider these two different situations throughout this work. I, I should also say that this part is still work in progress, so uh, I'm just going to expose some of the things that we have break down here. Now, let us move into uh, the objectives of this work. Well, what are we studying? Well, as I said before, and also as the title suggested, we're studying the interactions between the, uh, well, the, the, the anti-cancer molecules are some, on some complex biological media like DNA or a lipid membrane. Why are we doing that? Well. First of all, because we want to get some further insights into the mechanism of action of these drugs here. The reason for doing so is that this could, uh, in future, allow us to propose new functionaliz functionalizations of these molecules to obtain more efficient anti-cancer agents. So how are we doing this? Well, here there are all the, 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 let's say, the theoretical methodologies that I've been using throughout this work. Now, I would like to say that in particular, the two protagonists here are going to be molecular dynamics on the one hand and quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics on the other hand. Now, it is important for, well, for us to know that these two methodologies need also uh, to be interfaced with one another. So this was, let, let, let's say, we wanted to account for this thing via a, a, a toolkit that we have been developing in the group, which is called Mobile Tools, which I will introduce in what follows. Now, the outline itself. So since uh, the, the, the topics, the, the, there is a many of topics that have been treated here. So I have subdivided the thesis into the presentation into three different parts. Now, part one is going to consist of this uh, toolkit that we uh, developed in these three years. So what it does is basically it allows for the generation of quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics input files in an automatic manner, of course. And uh, this uh, features a, a particular uh, uh, we'll say a characteristic, which is a, a KCCF active space corrector. So basically, it automatically corrects for the active space of uh, the ensemble of geometries, whereby it uh, doesn't correspond to the one, that, for example, we want. I'm going to get into the details of this part specifically in what follows. So part two consists of uh, the, the membrane transport, transport of the cisplatin molecule. So in this case, well, here are the methodologies that we used. We set the permeation of this molecule into the lipid bilayer. I'm going to get into the details with some of these methodologies uh, when we get to that part. And finally, we're going to study the photophysics of anthraquinone well, and some of its derivatives when they are present in complex biological media like DNA and lipid. OK, and finally, we'll get to the conclusions, of course. Uh, so let's get into uh, part one, so the mobile tools toolkit. Now, suppose that we have this situation. So we have performed the classical molecular dynamic simulation of our system under study. However, suppose that we have done so by considering, for example, a classical force field. Now, suppose that we want, sorry, now we want to uh, account for uh, uh, an ensemble property that requires higher level of theory. In this case, what we do is we uh, fetch an ensemble of geometries from the classical and the trajectory, and then perform a quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics, computation on top of that. What we obtain in this case is a distribution of the observable we're interested in. So it could either be, for example, the, the energy, but it could also be uh, the electronic absorption spectra, interaction energies, or some other thermodynamical property. 
Now, in this part of the talk, I'm going to focus specifically on the, let's say, the, the computation of vertical excitation energies, because uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the CASICF corrector uh, uh, feature. The reason is because in part three, we are going to uh, uh, consider, uh, well, the, the computation of absorption spectra within this framework. Now, mobile tools. So what does it do? As I said before, it is an automatic quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics input generator. Uh, it also features this CASICF active space correction and an ensemble of geometries. And for the time being, it is interfaced with this software here. But of course, it is still under development and there are going to be more interfaces yet to come. OK, so let's talk a little bit about the input generator itself. Well, this is a script uh, mainframe inputs.py, which works on command line. Now, it takes two arguments, which are, let's say, two input files. The first one is going to be a, let's say, general input file. So it is general in the sense that we are going to provide it with information of the, well, the, the let's say, the geometries or the trajectory at hand, and also the, uh, the, the, the force field parameters of the system understanding. Then we have to uh, evidence which of the atoms correspond to the quantum mechanical region and which are in the molecular mechanics region. And finally, whether we want to include some solvent molecules in the QM region. Now, the second file is a template file which has the specifics regarding the uh, methodology, the quantum mechanical methodology that we wanna, that we wanna uh, let's say, employ. Now, in this case, we can see well, the, the syntax is, of course, uh, program dependent. And the, uh, more importantly, perhaps, is the fact that you have to point out whether you want point charges or not. Now, of course, they are important when we are doing quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics computations. OK, so at this point, let's go back to the absorption spectra, uh, let's say computation for an ensemble of geometries. So the reason is because, again, I'm going to feature this as a CF active space corrector in what follows. OK, so. What do we usually do when we uh, simulate an absorption spectrum? Well, the first thing that we do is we consider the equilibrium geometry at the ground state of the system under study, and then perform a, let's say, a single point quantum mechanics or QMMM computation on top of it, thus getting the excitation energies for that specific geometry. Now, of course, here we get an idea of where the excitations are and what are the energies and the oscillator strengths. However, here we are not reproducing the vibrational, uh, let's say, uh, broadening of these bands that we instead see experimentally with vibrational and meaningful thermal. So uh, what we do in our for, to account for that thermal broadening is to perform some sampling, consider an ensemble of geometries, and then again compute the excitations energy for each one of these geometries. I would like to say that for, for example, time-dependent DFT or some other uh, uh, methodologies, the description of the system is, cons is consistent throughout the ensemble of geometries. In, in this specific case, well, we have a functional, we have a basis set, and uh, yeah, that's, that goes pretty well for all the geometries. Now, what could happen when we go to uh, the CASA-CF? Well, it might happen that after the CASA-CF computation of the ensemble of geometries, the active spaces disappear somehow. So now, now I would like to say that it's important to have the same active space because we have to be consistent with the same level of theory we are using for the geometries. So let's get into uh, more details in this section. So suppose that we have a CASA-CF computation on a specific geometry. Let's say this is the ground state equilibrium geometry. So we already know uh, pretty well the, the, the active space that we want to consider. So for example, this is these three guys here. Now, what happens when we move from a single geometry to an ensemble of geometries? Well, it might happen that for some geometries, the CASA-CF computation converges to a, towards a wave function that gives us, let's say, the same active space that we had here, the one that we were interested in. However, for some of the situations like geometries two and three, we might see that there are some intruder molecular orbitals, like in this case and also in this case. Now, as I said before, we have to be consistent with the level of theory while the ensemble of geometries that we are considering. So for this reason, for geometries two and three, the active space would need to be corrected. So within the mobile tools toolkit, we have implemented this tool, with, which is basically an automatic corrector of the active space for, for an ensemble of geometries. So what does this algorithm do? 
the first thing that it does is it considers a uh, well a reference set of molecular orbitals. So, for example, the orbitals of the prime steady fluid geometry. Then, for each one of the problematic geometries, for example, geometry two, it takes the uh, the orbital set of that geometry, and then uh, well, it computes the overlap matrix between these two orbital sets. At this point, I, I should point out that in this matrix, the rows correspond to the reference molecular orbitals, whereas the columns correspond to the act, to the well, the problematic geometry orbitals. I'm going to call them sampled orbitals. Specifically. Now, afterwards, the algorithm analyzes the maximum value of each one of the columns. So, what does the maximum value tell us? Well, it basically tells us which reference molecular orbital is the one that is most similar to each one of the sampled molecular orbitals. So we can already see that, for example, within the, 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 the sampled active space, we see orbital four prime. Now, what do we see here? What we see is that it, the most reference orbital that is similar, that is most similar sorry, to four prime is outside of the reference active space. And we can already see that visually. So we know that we should somehow remove it from the active space. Likewise, in the case of five prime, in the sense that we should put it inside. So, once the algorithm has uh, identified these orbitals, what it does is it swaps them, generates a new guess wave function, and then performs a brand new Cassier computation in order for it to converge to the desired wave function. So in this case, we uh, consider the as uh, trial systems the five canonical nucleobases in a water, water salvation box. So what we did here was to perform a well, a 100 nanoseconds classical molecular dynamic simulation for each one of these uh, systems, and we fetched 100 geometries again for each one of them. On top of each of these geometries, we performed a, a single point Cassis CF computation to get, well, let's say the excitation energy. Now, what did we see there? After this first Cassis CF computation, we saw that for most of these systems, more than 30% of the geometry is present in an undesired active space with respect to the reference one. When we apply then the algorithm on top of uh, these uh, geometries, we saw that for most cases, we recovered more than 90% of the geometries, in the sense of the, the, the active spaces of those problematic geometries uh, well, for, yeah, for, for all these guys here. So th this, this is important because we applied this algorithm in part three, which corresponds to the calculation of absorption spectra with Cassis here, plus Cassis 2 uh, levels of theta. OK, now uh, let's move on to part two, which is the membrane transport of supply. I'd like to point out that throughout the, the part two and part three, we use the, the mobile tools toolkit to also generate the input files for the QMMM computations. So getting into part two, the permeation of supply inside the lipid membrane. So we are considering this situation here of this picture. We are going to see this picture several times today. Just for reference. Um, OK, so now the membrane transport. What's uh, the, the problem to solve here? Where here uh, we want to get the energetics of the permeation of the splatting inside a lipid bilayer. So we did so, uh, well, of course, using uh, uh, well, uh, a classical force field in this part. Now, this part, part two, is going to be subdivided into two different subparts, uh, sorry, subsections. So the first one, we'll, I'm going to call it classical energy decomposition analysis. So we are going to use classical methods, that is, force field methods. Now, in this case, we studied the permeation mechanism and then computed the interaction energies between these two subsystems present here. How do we do that? Well, by means of classical molecular dynamics. And we also use this technique, which is called the umbrella sampling. I'm going to get into the details in the next slide of this method. Now, the second subsection I call the quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics, ADA, because again, we are going to compute the, the interaction energies, but this time at a QMMM level of theory. How do we do that? Well, here is, uh, well, here are the methodologies that we used for reference. OK. So uh, I've mentioned the interaction energies here and here, but I haven't defined them. So what are these things here? Well, suppose that in our system, we have uh, two different fragments or two different subsystems. In our specific case, they're going to be splatting on the one hand and the lipid bilayer on the other hand. Now, the interaction energy between these two guys is, by definition, 
the difference between the energy of the overall complex minus the energies of each one of the fragments computed at the exact same geometry as they're present in the complex. Okay, so far so good. Now we're gonna focus on this first part, the classical eta. Okay, so as I said before, we computed the energetics of the permeation mechanism by means of umbrella sampling. Now in umbrella sampling, we have to define a reaction coordinate, which is a function of, well, the potential energy shown here. Now, in this case, uh, well, in, in our specific case, the reaction coordinates is gonna be the distance between cisplatin and the lipid bilayer. Okay, so what do we do here? First of all, we use it in cases where we have like large energy barrier soda with conventional molecular dynamics. It is, well, very difficult or impossible to thoroughly sample these regions like that here. This is the main reason for using umbrella sampling. Now, in this case, what we do is we subdivide the reaction coordinate into different, uh, let's call them windows. So basically, this is a partition of this interval here. Afterwards, for each one of these windows, we perform a classical molecular dynamic simulation. However, we do so by applying a so-called bias potential, so these red guy here. Why do we apply a bias potential? Well, because we want to thoroughly sample each one of these regions. And if we didn't have this bias potential that keeps the system inside, the system would naturally want to go back to, well, in this case, either one of the minima. So with these, what do we obtain? Well, we obtain a, for each one of the windows, a distribution of the reaction coordinates. So these are like histograms, let's say. Now, why do we want these distributions? Well, because we, the, with these distributions, we obtain the free energy as a function of uh, this reaction coordinate. Now, I have to point out here that this has a U super index, which means that we have an unbiased probability distribution here. What we obtained here was a biased probability distribution because we used a bias potential. So what we have to do is we have to unbias these distributions with the formula here. Okay, so uh, now let's get into, into what we actually did here. Well, we, uh, of course, here again is the, the, the phenomenon we're studying. Um, so below is the uh, free energy or the potential of mean force along these reaction coordinates. Reaction coordinate against the distance between these guys here. Now, I would like at this point to point out that uh, this part of the project was also uh, a part of Lorena's, Lorena Ruano's bachelor thesis. So we both uh, worked uh, thoroughly on this, this part here. Now, uh, what did we, we, we do there? Well, now in the, in the, in the potential of main force profile, we define two uh, different sections of intervals. One is the minimum region, minimum of the, of the PMF, which consists of cisplatin sitting on top of the lipid bilayer. The other one is the maximum, which consists of cisplatin being at the center of the lipid bilayer. Afterwards, we consider that, well, again, we subdivided the entire system as two different subsystems. One was the entire lipid bilayer, and the other one was cisplatin. Now, at this point, we computed the interaction energy between these two systems. And since we did so by means of a classical force field, we obtained a nice expression, which is the one shown here. So in this case, we can already identify different contributions. So one is the electrostatic contribution, so basically a Coulomb, Coulomb potential, and the other one is non-electrostatic, so this guy here. Now, within the non-electrostatic part, we can further identify two, let's say, contributions. One is the poly repulsion, and the other one is a dispersive attraction negative. So what we did here was uh, what I mentioned before, an energy decomposition analysis of the interaction energy. Okay, so let's jump on to the results. Well, let, let's consider what happens in these two regions. Well, first of all, when we consider the minimum region, we see that the electrostatic contribution is predominant of the non-electrostatic. <laughs> so uh, well, yeah, this is what I said. Now, when we move from the minimum to the maximum region, we see that the two roles somehow invert. So basically, now the non-electrostatic contributions are predominant, albeit a slight difference. Okay, so this is what happens in the 
let's say in the classical world, and we consider the classical force field. Now, what happens when we move here towards the quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics part? Well, let's first uh, consider again the workflow of the second subsection. Well, here is the system that we just saw before. Um, now, at this point, what we did once again to focus on these two regions, and for each one of these regions, we considered a classical molecular dynamic simulation. So basically, we took the simulations from the umbrella sampling computation. Afterwards, we fetched an ensemble of geometries with, uh, with uh, the, the mobile tools toolkit, and then performed the quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics computation on top of each one of these geometries. Once we did so, we performed the energy decomposition analysis. So here is a color code that I will introduce in the next section, but basically it talks about the different ADA contributions to the interaction energy. Now here, uh, well, uh, for uh, just for, for curiosity, I, I showed you the computational details so the number of quantum mechanical atoms that we consider and then also the number of geometries that we account for. Okay, so let's move back to the problem of the computation of the interaction energies in a quantum mechanical form. So um, again, here is the, the definition of the interaction energy. As we know, it is, let's say, quite general. And now we ask ourselves, so we are moving from classical to quantum to quantum mechanics. Can we perform some kind of a energy decomposition analysis in the QM world? Well, the answer is yes, and we can do several different things. But in this thesis, we focused on a methodology developed by Professor Marcos Mandado from the University of Vigo. So uh, what did they, they, they do here? Well, the first consider the expression of the total energy as a function of the electron density. Afterwards, what they did was to express this electron density as a sum of unperturbed monomeric contributions, so one for each fragment, plus a sorry, two perturbative terms, which are called globally a, the deformation density. So they're subdivided into a poly repulsive term and a polarization term. In this way, we obtain, well, they obtained a nice uh, decomposition of the interaction energy in terms of physically meaningful terms. So we have an electrostatic term, a poly term, an inductive term with, that we did not have in the classical force field, and finally, a dispersive term. <laughs> okay, so far, so good. Now, in practice, how do we compute the interaction energy? Well, uh, in the quantum mechanical framework, so we compute the energy of the complex minus the, ener the energies of each one of the fragments, also using the same basis set as the complex to correct for the basis set superposition error. So this is pointed out as the super indices here. So these are, uh, the, 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 we're using the same basis set. This is quantum <laughs> mechanics, but what about QMMM? Well, in our specific case, we introduced the molecular mechanics point charges of the rest of the system in the computation of the monomer and also in the computation of, sorry, I said monomer, I meant the complex and also in the computation of the part, the fragment that consisted of the lipid membrane. Okay, uh, let's get, let's jump now on to the results. So again, here is the, the partition of the interaction energy. Now, since we have an ensemble of geometries, let's say 400 geometries in this case, two for each, the 20 for each region. So what we obtain is a distribution of each one of the energy terms that we have in this partition. Now, let's consider first the region of the minimum of the, of the free energy uh, term. Now, what we see here is, well, the electrostatic term presents a minus 66 kilocals per mole contribution, whereas globally, the non-electrostatic part, which is the sum of these three guys here, is plus 17.8 kilocals. Now, the first thing is that I would like to point out that this is actually positive. And you might guess that this is due to the more than uh, Thought compensation of the poly repulsion in this case here. Now, when we move from the minimum to the maximum of the potential being force, what we see is that again the electrostatic term is predominant, although in this case the non-electrostatic term is negative, but still let's say small. Okay, at this point we can do a comparison between the classical result and the quantum mechanics molecular mechanics result. Well, first of all, when we consider the, the we consider the minimum of the classical uh, 
both uh, results, we saw that the electrostatic term was predominant over the non-electrostatic one. In the case of QMMM, we observed, the, 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 let's say, a similar trend. So this guy was um, more dominant than this guy here. Um, now, when we move from the minimum to the maximum, what we saw here was, uh, let's say, a contradictory result in the sense that the, 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 whereas in the classical case, the non-electrostatic term was predominant, the maximum, in the QMMM, the electrostatic term was overall predominant in both cases. Another thing that I would like to point out again is, well, the magnitude of the poly repulsion, especially at the minimum. So this induced us to suggest that perhaps within the, the force field that we are using, the poly repulsion is being underestimated. Okay, so this was for part two, so the study of the susplanet molecule. Now let's move on to part three, which is the photophysics of untracking and ensemble derivatives in complex biological media. Okay, so I show you again this picture because why not? And uh, and then now we are focusing on this part of the other problems, the study of the interaction and derivatives. Now, uh, again, since we did different things here, I'm gonna subdivide this part into two different subsections. So the first one consists of the study of the intercalation binding mode of interaction on inside a, a DNA double strand. In other words, it's photophysics. The second part instead consists of the study of the permeation of an on inside a lipid bilayer, similarly to cisplatin, and afterwards it's photophysics. So for the time being, we're going to focus on this first part. So again, what did we do? We studied the intercalation mode of that molecule inside DNA, and then it's photophysics. So here are the methodologies that we used here. So let's get into further details in this regard. So here's our system on the study. This is a double strand model of, of DNA. So this is this our guanine and cytosine. So the first thing that we did was to consider the different potential conformations that Antrachinon could assume within this, uh, let's say, uh, binding model. So what we did was to perform molecular dynamic simulation. Now, here the question is how to define or characterize these different conformations. Well, what we did was to define two uh, vectors here. So one is the axis, the long axis of Antrachinon, and the other one is an axis defined as the, 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 the bond direction, the hydrogen bonds of guanine and cytosine, only, only one there. Now, the, the conformations were, were characterized by uh, considering the angle that these two vectors could form. Now, here are, let's say, the, the, the results. What we could see was that we had, let's say, uh, two similar com com conformations, which uh, we, we call the symmetric. We call them like that because these consisted of the two vectors being parallel, which means somehow the most stacking between antrachinon and, for example, guanine. And two, uh, let's say, rotated conformations, where, whereby the two vectors were no longer parallel. Okay, so this was the first part of this work. Now, the second part consisted of the study of the excited states of and tracking on along with one guanine molecule. So we consider these two molecules at a quantum mechanical region. So what we did there was to define uh, somehow to characterize the, the, the different types of uh, excited states that, that we could obtain. So one is a monomeric excited state where we could have a local excitation either on guanine or on and tracking on. An exciton where we have local excitations on both uh, fragments. Then we have charge transfer from one fragment to the other, usually from one into the antrachinon. And finally, an eczemer, where pretty much everything could happen. Okay, so uh, of course, uh, the, this sounds quite, uh, let's say, qualitative. We want to do this thing as quantitative as possible. So in this case, we use an approach developed by uh, Felix Plaza. Uh, in England, uh, now in England. And so basically uh, this approach consists of viewing the excitations as a whole uh, particle, let's say, uh, situation where the, the excitation, so the, the electron leaves a hole and a brand new, uh, let's say, particle is, is formed. So this is like, this is most uh, best visually seen within the charge transfer uh, pictures here. So uh, more into the details, what they did was to consider the one particle transition density matrix, which is basically a generalization of uh, a 
that's like the, 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 the density matrix. Then they define some descriptors to characterize these four different excited states. So the, the first one is uh, the charge transfer number. So it is defined in terms of uh, this integral of uh, the one particle transition density matrix. So here, the integral tells us the probability of the hole represented as RH. So the probability that the hole is in region A, so in monomer A, sorry. Well, at the same time, the electron or the particle is in region B, monomer B. So this is the charge transfer number. Now, a second uh, descriptor is called the so-called average delocalization band. So it is defined as the, the, the mean value of these two guys here. So these are called the, pro, the participation ratio of the hole and of the electron. And it basically tells us well, quantitatively how much each one of the monomers participates to an excitation. So it somehow tell us, tells us whether the excitations are localized on the monomers or delocalized. Of course, uh, these are numbers. And somehow, uh, one should define uh, the excitations depending, the excitation type depending on a range of these two parameters here. So for example, we have a charge transfer excitation whenever the charge transfer number is greater than 0 0.8, as we can see here. OK. So let's go back to the results. Uh, now, what we did here was to consider these uh, two situations, the symmetric and the rotated. So let's first see the density of, state, of states of the symmetric situation. So in this case in particular, where we have the contributions of the four types of excited states, what we can see here is that the monomer contribution is 42%, whereas the charge transfer is 40.7. So these are the predominant contributions. Now, what happens when we move from the symmetric to the rotated one? Well, uh, let's say, surprise, surprise, more or less, that rotated conformation uh, provided, provided us with a larger monomer uh, charge, uh, sorry, monomer uh, excited state situation, so 45.6, whereas the charge transfer situation reduced from 30 to 22%. Okay, so uh, this was uh, subsection one. So I'm fracking on plus DNA. Now, now let us focus on this last part of the talk, the permeation of fracking on inside the liquid membrane. Now, what we <laughs> did there was to study the energetics of the permeation, and afterwards, well, the photophysics of, of the molecule inside the, the membrane. So I, I got to point out that, that this is a work in progress, which means we're still doing things here. So I'm going to talk just to the uh, up to, to, to the point that I could get here, let's say. Uh, so this work is being uh, yeah, sorry, it, it, it's being carried out on top of, uh, well, these three derivatives here, biodin, surangidiol, and pyridine. Now, the reason is because for these three molecules, these people have observed the relatively uh, promising uh, cytotoxic activity. Now, why specifically these three guys here? Well, because in that same work, they observed that whereas rubiodin and surangidiol presented similar cytotoxicity, the pyridine molecule presented a higher cytotoxicity. Okay, so this work is being done in collaboration with Professor Marcos, uh, sorry, Marco Garavelli from the University of Bologna. Okay, so in this case here, uh, well, the, the first thing was a study of the permeation mechanism of each one of the molecules into a lipid bilayer <coughs> model. So uh, here again, Let's say the plots should be read from left to right because we have the reaction coordinate as the distance between these two uh, fragments here. Now we did so for rubiodin and then for the other two molecules, rangidiol and pyridin, again with umbrella sampling. So the thing that we can already observe here is that first of all, the, per the permeation profiles are quite similar. In the sense that here we have a small difference of less than two kilograms per mole. For rest, they are pretty much the same. This suggests at least the in principle, we can hypothesize that the differences observed in the uh, in the cytotoxicity of these three molecules need not be related with the cell uptake of each one of these drugs. So of course, this is just a hypothesis. So the differences should be mainly associated with the character of the excited states. So uh, this, of course, represents the second part of this project. Uh, so what we are doing now is studying the photophysics of all three molecules at the minimum region of each one of the permeation, uh, let's say, profiles here. In particular, 
And so in particular, we're doing so uh, by means this time of wave function methods, so CASA CF plus vibration theory, and we also need to account for vibrational motion. So why wave function methods? Well, because as I said at the beginning, perhaps the, the most interesting part of, 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 of these molecules is the fact, the fact that, it, that they undergo winter system crossing before being cytotoxic. cytotoxic. Okay, so in this case here, of course, the first thing that we needed to do was to define an active space for this system. Now, these systems are huge, so we cannot consider the entire, let's say, 2018 active space there. So we, sh we had to do a benchmark and confront with the experiment. How did we do so? Well, I got to point out that the experiments uh, available are at the absorption spectrum of probiotin and soren GDL in the presence of chloroform. So for this reason, we carried out uh, a classical molecular dynamic simulation on that solvent for each one of these molecules. Afterwards, uh, what we did was a cluster analysis on 100 clusters from the, tra from the trajectories. And we obtained a finally a quantum mechanics molecular mechanics geometry optimization. So we optimized the geometry in the solvent to compute the absorption spectra of these molecules there. Get an insight into where the excitation energies are. Okay, so this benchmark, the smallest active space we considered was that of uh, a 12 9 active space, which is rather small. So, what we saw here was that the first band was pretty well reproduced in both cases. So, yeah, sorry, this is the experimental spectrum in chloroform again. However, the second band was not so well represented for neither of these cases. So, what we did was to increase gradually the active space in these two situations. So here I'm showing these three active spaces here. Now, what we can see is that despite increasing the active space, this is the spectra from before, what we saw was that, especially in the case of 1412, it was a well, globally worse situation than in the case of, for example, these two smaller active spaces. So we're not even reproducing the first one. So for this reason, and also because, well, it's cheaper, we consider the smallest active space, which is 12 9. So the next thing that we did, so let's say the final thing, was the computation of the absorption spectrum of each of, of, of these molecules inside the lipid membrane, so at the minimum region. So in this case, what, well, what we did was uh, to consider an ensemble of 100 geometries for each one of the molecules. Uh, this is again the experimental chloroform. This is the computer spectrum, spectrum in the membrane. So in this case, what we observe well, is a redshift uh, of the uh, spectrum in the membrane with respect to the uh, spectrum in chloroform. So uh, of course, this is still work in progress. I, I hope to, to finish it before September, but we'll see. Uh, so the next step is uh, the study of the intersystem crossing of these three molecules. Now, with this, now we, we get to the conclusions. Um, so. We saw part one, which was uh, the, the development of this mobile tools toolkit. So it allowed us for generating uh, quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics input files. Uh, and in particular, I talked about this feature of the automatic correction of the act of the CASCF active space for a problematic geometry in some of the geometry. The second part was the study of the membrane transport of the cisplatin molecule. So we evidenced well, the potential mean force of 10.4 kilocalories per mole. More importantly, we saw that when considering a classical force field, the nonpolar interactions were predominant only inside, inside the membrane. However, in the case of quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics, we had a contradictory result in that regard, because also inside the membrane, the electrostatic contributions were predominant. And we also suggested that the poly repulsion is underestimated by the classical force field. And finally, in the case of the photophysics of antrachinons, we had a uh, we studied the the, 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 the stacked situation in uh, of the antrachinon the pristine antrachinon molecule in DNA, and uh, we also studied the antrachinon uh, derivatives to the permeation mechanism inside lipid membranes, and we there we saw a spectral redshift inside the membrane. And with this. I would like to, well, first of all, thank all the Mo Biochem uh, group for uh, these uh, real nice uh, three years of work with them. Also, our collaborators in, uh, well, in Spain, Marcus, and also abroad, 
and uh, uh, especially Juan Conoqueira, because were not for him, of course, I wouldn't be here right now. And well, of course, all of you for your kind attention. Yeah. Okay, of course, I'm prone to answer any questions naturally. Uh, okay. So thank you, thank you very much, Gustavo, for the nice presentation. I think it's, it's time now for for this uh, jury to work a little bit and ask uh, some questions. So I, I I I know I'm just going to follow the order of the official document. I know I'm the last one to ask, but just following the order, I guess is it's going to be Ines, the first one to ask questions. Maybe I don't know if you can approach here yeah. a little bit because of the microphone which is there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. okay. So I'd like to start by congratulating you, Gustavo, for the, um, the very nice work. Um, I would also like to congratulate your supervisor also for the great supervision task and also the other members of the group that has contributed to, to the work and also the collaborators. So, but specifically, I would like to congratulate you because of, uh, well, I think it's a um, very complete thesis where you have uh, uh, do some uh, development. Uh, you have also do some uh, programming and also some applications. So I think you have done everything. So the only thing which is missing is some experiments here, and you'll have everything. So, well, I think it's um, yeah, I think it's a great um, um, work. Um, I also found the manuscript very clear. So thank you for the uh, very very uh, very clear theoretical overview that you that you provided. Also the broad introduction to the to the subject. And um, yeah, also the results of the discussion were also very clear. So for for at least for me, which uh, uh, I'm not uh, completely in, uh, in the field. So if I'm allowed, I'm going to. Uh, Make a small thesis uh, on, uh, on on what you did. So the only thing that uh, well, I found that uh, for instance, the reference to the figures in the manuscript are a little bit messy. So sometimes you were making reference to a particular figure which I didn't found because uh, uh, I don't know if it was uh, problem with the LaTeX or, or something. So some of the names of the figure were changed in the in the discussion. So well, it not, was not very difficult to to find the right figure, but at least. Yeah, so some of the so you have some uh, you have some references in the text which do not correspond to any level of the of the of the peers. And also uh, the 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 only thing that uh, was a little bit weird to me was also, for instance, when uh, in, as you uh, have done a thesis uh, which is a completion of papers, so sometimes the introductions of the different chapters uh, overlap one with each other because it's actually the same uh, the same scheme. So yeah, so similar. Yeah. 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 But anyway, so um, yeah, congratulations for the for the very hard and very and very nice work. Okay, so I have plenty of questions, but uh, maybe if um, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, if it turns too long, just interrupt me. So um, I'm, I think I'm going to follow the um, the. Um, the, lab, the outline of the of the manuscripts, all the chapters that. Um, so I'm going to start with with um, with, with some questions about chapter two. So I'm okay. going to profit that I'm um, um, uh, in the in the committee to ask you for a pers well, personal well uh, professional question, but that uh, is of my interest. So regarding the more the mobile kit uh, uh, tool. So could you please tell me, so I'm interested in uh, performing some uh, um, um, simulation for transient absorption spectra. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you are uh, familiar to this, uh, to this technique. Uh, uh, you use like a couple of um, uh, pulses. The first one just drives the system from the ground state to the excited state, and then you let the system evolve in the excited state potential in the surface, and then you excite once again the system in order to follow the dynamics. Okay? So, yeah. So most of the times, so we work when well, we work with experimentalists. So uh, this is a way to support, or this is uh, uh, something that you use to guide um, um, uh, the dynamics. So I would like to ask you how difficult it would be to expand this uh, more uh, VOP2 in order to um, simulate this transient absorption spectrum, because I think it should be something quite straightforward. So could you comment on this? Uh... Yes, yes, uh, of course. Uh, now, 
for, for the time being, we, we have used the, 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 the toolkit exclusively uh, considering uh, uh, trajectories in the ground watering state. Uh, so in, in those cases, uh, the, the whenever you want to simulate like, like, trends in absorption spectra or you, 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 of course, you need to see the evolution, as you said before, of the system at a given well, uh, electronic excited state. And there, in particular, you could eventually uh, have, uh, let's say, transitions from among different excited states. So you could have phenomena like internal conversion between singlets or between states of the same uh, spin multiplicity and also and also intersystem crossing, like the phenomenon we want to study with contractions. Now, in the case, uh, well, the, the the mobile tools toolkit i mean in order for you to do so you would need to uh, perform uh, well you, you could do several things but uh, for, for example for the systems we're considering like which are quite large uh, uh well um the best thing would be for example to do a semi semi-classical uh, trajectory so molecular dynamics is always hoping basically so uh the this toolkit mainly aims at so it, it starts after you have gotten the let's say the trajectory let's say the, the molecular dynamics and then uh, so you fetch the geometries from there so it does it in an automatic manner so for the time being we're focusing let's say on, on, on problems that regard the let's say the the, the, the frank common region uh the situation of surface surface hopping would be uh, would, would, would be complicated because uh, I mean again I, I'm not quite familiar there uh, but uh, yeah you would need to perform I mean basically you would need to to, to implement the the, the the entire algorithm for example the, the, the Tullis algorithm to simulate the, the transition between different excited states uh, so I don't think that starting from the mobile tools toolkit would be straightforward to be honest but things that could be done instead would be to uh, somehow uh, extend the, the interfaces between, let's say, codes that do surface hopping, like, for example, Shark that we have here, the one, and it's also in Vienna, or uh, Nudnex uh, from Marsilla, uh, and uh, some uh, molecular mechanics codes, I don't know, Amber, Charm, Romax, uh, NAMD. Uh, now, this is already done, this has already been done with uh, different software. So. Uh, the, the, the optics of the toolkit that we presented were, were slightly different. So we were focusing on, on dynamics at the ground electronic state. So I, I would need to think a little bit about it <laughs> because, yeah, it's not, not, not straightforward. That's it. Okay. okay, thank you. So now uh, let us focus on this um, active space preservation tool. Um, yeah. Does the um, orientation of the different geometries that you are generating during your molecular dynamic simulation needs to be the same beforehand with the reference geometry that you use? Uh, or, or do you have uh, implemented something that, I mean, I, I, I imagine that during the molecular dynamic simulation, the molecule cannot only uh, be become distorted but also rotated. So, do you have, I mean, uh, do you have something that first aligns the two molecules and then because this will also affect the overlap uh, um, calculation for the for the orbitals, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, e exactly. Of of course. Um, you first of all need. I mean, you you could do uh, several different things. For, for for the time when we when we when we let's say published that paper, what the, the software did was to rotate. So you had the reference uh, geometry with the reference active space. So the first thing that you did was to take, let's say, the ensemble of geometries, the trajectory, let's say, and then you rotated the 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 molecule so as to align it with the reference uh, the reference geometry. So you rotate it for, for each one of the uh, of the geometries. Uh, so you, of course you rotate the, the in, in that specific situation. What you do is you consider a rotation matrix. Considering exclusively the molecule under interest, which means that, uh, I mean, you just need to align them. But if you have a QMMM situation, of course, you have the point charges. But that is a second step in the sense that once you have gotten the rotation matrix that aligns the two molecules, the, the point charges are rotated with the same rotation matrix. So, uh, so yeah, I also in in that paper, uh, well. We, we implemented, let's say, the, the, 
the the, the rotation itself so it's basically done by minimizing the root mean square between the two uh, the, 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 the two geometries uh, I think it, it uses a well it, it uses quaternions to describe the rotations but uh, well, this is extremely detailed and honestly odd. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, so, so yeah, once you get the rotation matrix, you rotate the entire system. So otherwise you would get completely absurd, let's say, all the maps between the, okay. the, the orbital spaces. <clears throat> um, and do the orbitals of your reference and um, the orbitals that you, um, the initial guess, well, the orbitals that you get in the first process of calculation, do they need to be calculated with the same basis aid on the same program? Oh, and uh, imagine, so sometimes, for instance, you, you get some uh, nice orbitals from uh, Gaussian, from the capacity of calculation of Gaussian, and then mm -hmm. you want to use them, for instance, uh, to switch to, to, to open more cast. So could this be done automatically or not? So you need, at this stage of the of the kit, you need to provide the, the program with um, orbitals, with reference orbitals calculated with the same data set, and also with the same program as the one that you have um, for the CASA-CF calculation the molecular dynamics? Um, with regard to the basis set, yes. Because, uh, of course, if you have two different basis sets, the two orbital, well, the, the two subspaces of your Hilbert space are going to have different dimensionalities. So that it, it is important that the basis sets be the same in both cases. That the Now, that the let's say that the CAS orbitals uh, need to be obtained with the same software. No, this need not be the case. Uh, the, the, in, the, in the sense that, well, after all, the, the software what it takes is a, a Molden uh, input file. Okay. So in the sense that uh, there are several software that, that print the orbitals in, in Molden. Now, the, the really important thing is that, of course, if you are using different software, you exactly know what you want to obtain as reference orbitals in, this, in the sense that, well, I, I want to use state average CAS CF, and I could use Gauss, and I could use uh, open MOLCAS. Now, the implementations may or may not be the same. So you, you should also take into account this, this thing. Of course, you would expect that for different software, if you are using the exact same methodology you obtain within like a few decimal points, the same, for example, state average energy and also the same orbital uh, uh, space. So. And um, um, it was not clear to me how do you, when you perform the molecular dynamic simulations and you perform the CASA-CF calculation for the um, snapshots, so do you, what initial guess for the orbitals do you use? So do you use the, as initial guess the orbitals from the reference or you perform a CASA-CF calculation using a hard to orbitals as initial guess from scratch or? Uh, well, you usually, employ uh let's say the 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 guess uh, as guess orbitals the orbitals that you have uh, for example the reference orbitals so um so yeah it takes it takes the orbitals in the molden file and it takes them as reference in the specific case of, of molecules let's say it creates the import file from that molden and then uses them as guess orbitals and that was let, let's say that was awkward at first uh, the fact of obtaining these differences that I showed you here, especially in the case of guanine. Maybe I'm, I'm going to go back there because we there we see the, let's see the, the wrong active spaces that we got at the beginning. Well, the undesired um, here. So yeah, here we can see that, um, let's say with the wrong, sorry, in the case of guanine, 77 out of 100 geometries presented a wrong active space. And yeah, this, this is weird because we're putting guess orbitals that would presumably uh, converge. And if you provide a guess input, which is close to the wave function you want to get to, you should you should converge towards that wave function. Now, the, the, I, I think the main feature here is the fact that we have point charges that surround the system. Now, the, the guess orbitals that we had here were the orbitals, the, the, let's say, the... the uh, the orbitals obtained from uh, uh, what's his name from Thiel's basis set. Uh, sorry, from from what's his name? Walter Thiel, I think. So he he, he did a work back in two thousand and eight where uh, uh, he put like an ensemble of twenty eight uh, 
molecules and he somehow benchmarked the different active spaces. So we took uh, the, the, the reference active space from, let's say, the, the same settings as, as this, this, this here. I'm getting messed up the names. I think it was not Thiel, but in any case, he worked with Thiel. <laughs> if it wasn't him, but so yeah, the, the, the important thing is that they were, let, let's see, it's called them consolidated by basis sets, the kind of reference. So, um, so again, those are basis sets, so reactive spaces. So those are active spaces obtained in gas phase. Now here we have point charges and the presence of these point charges might somehow like said, uh, Let's say in general, well, it, it, it does indeed perturb the, 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 the Hamiltonian, and as a result, you don't need to, to get the exact same wave function there. So I, I'm just, I would just like, like to get to, to the specifics of that work itself. So what we observed there was most of the problematic molecular orbitals, even, well, that, that were not recovered or were not present within the active space after, let's see, the first CASA CF calculations, where orbitals that presented long pairs, which were most exposed to the, to the solvent, to the point charges. So there might, I mean, we unfortunately did not, did not further explore this, but we saw that, I mean, I mean th this could be one uh, main cause for the orbitals getting outside of the desired active space at first. So, um, yeah, so now I have two questions in one. So do you recommend to undertake one of these um, uh, preservation active space analysis when you perform uh, molecular non adiabatic molecular dynamic simulations? And if so, how much do you think this would increment the computational cost of your molecular dynamics? Mm. Uh, I mean, that I, I would recommend it so long as, let's say, the character of the wave function does not change along the dynamics. Uh, this is this is something that that happens when you do a non-adiabatic molecular dynamics. For example, you could go from a singlet to a triplet in intersystem crossing. Uh, so, oh, of course, I think the best thing there would be to uh, have the, the, the active space that you need. But yes, I, I would recommend it because once you have, let's say, the reference active space you're interested in, so all the possible orbitals that contribute to the description of the singlet and the triplet in that hand, you still don't want to have potential intruders there. Uh, now, of course, I did not have this situation because I, 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 I've never done not everybody dynamic molecular dynamics, but I know people that have done so. And I know that in some cases along the dynamics, their active space has been has basically been it's gonna mess up fundamentally. So I would suggest that the main problem is the second part, the computational cost. Uh, because of course, if you have a wrong active space, you have to regenerate, let's say a guess by doing this orbital rotation. And then, um, and then yeah, perform a brand new CASA CF computation. So it would be expensive. Um, I think you would need to get a, a compromise between the two things because, yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm. I'm going to skip this one. Mm. Now I'm switching to chapter seven. Okay. okay. So um, in the introduction of chapter seven, you actually mentioned that um, the preference of um, uh, for some uh, binding modes actually depends or can depend on uh, how you substitute your point sensitizer. So the question is, so are there any general trends which um, um, allows you to uh, know beforehand um, which of the possible binding modes of a photo sensitizer to uh, the molecule or whatever? Um, I mean, how to tune your molecule in order to have preferably one binding mode instead of the other, or, or they aren't? Uh, well, precise trends, like, let's say they do not come directly to my mind all, all yeah. bit. Uh, people have studied, uh, well, people have studied, of course, the binding modes of different photosensitizers to DNA. Now, 
in that case, you could have not only the intercalation binding mode, but you could also have, I'm going to go to, to the page at that point. Uh, uh, where is it? Over here. So apart from the inter intercalation binding mode, you would also uh, have uh, other two different binding modes. Uh, so one is uh, a binding to, to, let's see, so the DNA presents two groups, a major group, which is, a, 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 let, let's say, one of the, of the faces of the helix that, that is exposed that is larger, and, mm -hmm. major, and the other one is minor. So now, for example, for these, for these um, species, they could bind to the major or minor group, like this way. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the, the functionalization, yeah, can influence where does the, the molecule bind. So for example, I don't know if you, uh, well, for example, like, like so, we, we have uh, these two um, carbonyl groups. If you put, I don't know, for example, hydroxyl, they might interact with the polar groups that are present in either of the groups, and so on and so forth. Now, in the particular situation of the intercalation, well, you could, for example, propose functionalizations that are, uh, let, let's say, the, the thing that we saw here was that uh, the charge transfer was most favored when we so the charge transfer character was most favored when we had the two, let's see, the tracheal molecule and the guanine molecule aligned. So one way of um, um, introducing functionalization, functionalizations would be to put some groups that are bulky enough that hinder somehow the rotation of the molecule inside DNA, but not so bulky so that the molecule cannot enter DNA. So good. You could you could also somehow get some some, some compromise there as well. And um, do you know if there are any binding modes which are preferred to others uh, to produce a stronger damage to to DNA? So is intercalation the binding mode that provokes the, the larger damage to DNA, or is it the binding to the major group of the? Um. I mean, for example, in the cases of the, I mean, well, because it, it could also depend on different factors. First of all is whether the molecule prefers a binding mode or not. So this also, let's say, affects the cytotoxicity. Uh, I, I don't have them here, but I have done also some, some studies of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, computations for binding energies of these, the, the three derivatives with DNA, and I've observed that there is a larger binding energy when you have the intercalation mode. So we can say that um, this is a major factor that defines the cytotoxicity. Now, apart from that, uh, well, it, this is related with the fact of why we chose, well, let's say the guanine molecule as the one present in the QM region. Well, one thing is be, be, because it somehow uh, could be the, the proneest to suffering uh, DNA damage because, well, at least in the brown state, it is the one that presents the most favorable uh, redox <laughs> potential. So it is proneest to undergo, for example, uh, redox re reactions. Uh, I cannot give a, a definitive answer, but from what I've observed from the things that I did outside of the thesis, uh, I mean, that the, 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 the intercalation mode could be a, a somehow one way to most efficiently, let's say, uh, seek for the for the reaction with one to present, to, to introduce a DNA damage, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, I was thinking about what would be the effect of, uh, so in this particular case, in the case of Antrachinon, you introduce in the QM region, the Antrachinon molecule in just one binary molecule, right? Yeah. So I was thinking, um, Thus, I mean, don't you need like the four different uh, nucleobases in order to properly describe the stacking interaction between antraquinone and, um, and, and DNA? So I was wondering whether, for instance, these rotational conformations are just not an artifact of the fact that you are only considering in your QM. So I guess that with point charges, you are not at all describing properly uh, stacking uh, interaction, right? right? So if you are just introducing one um, one molecule into your actual space, aren't you somehow 
biasing um, the interaction of your photosensitizer with uh, the DNA strand? Um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. Actually, that was a question that we got from the referees when we submitted the paper. Um, so yeah, the fact of considering a simple guanine molecule in the QM region, yeah, this is this is a, a let's call it an oversimplification. Uh, of course, as, as you say, you, you, as you said correctly, you should include well at least the four nearest neighbors to the, the anthracnose molecule. But even in those cases, the, it has been uh, observed that both theoretically and experimentally that you could have excitons that even move like three, four, sorry, three, four, uh, 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 let, let's say, nuclear bases along the, 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 the DNA strand. So uh, in this case, yeah, we considered the simplest case scenario uh, because the first goal of this work was to, well, to say the, to, sorry, to see uh, the conformational behavior of the anthracnose molecule. So uh, let's say that a more complete thing that could be done was would be that after having done so, one could gradually increase the number of uh, quantum mechanical molecules of the uh, well, nuclear bases uh, to see how uh, the, to see whether, whether there is a, a, a trend in the, in the change of uh, the different contributions to the three excited states. So yeah, this is this is not a complete picture at all. This is just a simplification. So this is the simplest case scenario to see what what's the character of these excited states. But, yeah, to be more correct, you would need more more nuclear bases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one question regarding the augustic view calculation. So for the um, at the for the oscillator strength, are you using the um, CACCF oscillator strength or the perturbatively modified oscillator strength? Uh, those are the CASA-CF oscillator strengths because in principle, at least when, at least when, when, when you perform the single point CASPT2 computations, what you're getting is the second order correction to the energy. But still when you, when, yeah, when you consider the wave function to compute the oscillator strengths, to, to compute the, 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 the transition moment dipoles, you do so with the CASA-CF <coughs> wave functions. Uh, at least, well, in this case, it was it was done that way. So you would you would actually need the, the, the complete wave function of the cas pt two computation to do so. Okay, now I'm switching to chapter eight. Okay. Mm, I was a little bit puzzled um, with the result obtained for the spectra um, calculated with different active spaces. I think it is this one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And um, well, the first thing that I do not understand isn't the 12, 9, and the 14, 10 active spaces like a little bit unbalanced because I actually think that if I remember correctly, you have a different number of pi and pi uh, antibonding orbitals. So, yeah, is this, it's uh, true. I mean, is, so, why? Uh, well, uh, th that is a good question because, in principle, yeah, you should, uh, you, you should include, let's say, the bonding pi orbitals plus the corresponding anti-bonding. So there is a main reason I I don't remember whether I put it, I put it out in the in the work. But so what I did with in order for us to start with this the simplest case was to let's say perform a benchmark with uh, different DFT functionals. I think I, I use like seven different DFT functionals uh, with uh, um, a polarizable continuum modding model. And uh, in the case of both molecules, where, where first of all, we saw that I, uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed saying this, but the functional that behaved the best was the bifilbic functional. I mean, it reproduced extremely accurately the spectra for both molecules, not just for a single one. So it was the case. So what I did was to consider all the, all the the molecular orbitals that participated to the to the to the excitations of the first ten excited states. I actually took them as guest orbitals for these CASA CF computations. Now the 12.9 corresponded with 
with that, that, that with the situation where you consider all the, the demote orbitals that participate to those excitations. So that that's the main reason. But I, I agree, it's 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 unbalanced. Yeah. Okay, and um, um, the character of the electronic state is actually my same between uh, all the different um, active spaces that you examine, or or they are just different? Because I mean. I assume that all the so the larger active spaces are just, are just based on the smaller active spaces just by introducing, by introducing. Uh, additional um, orbitals in the active space, right? Yeah, and this is uh, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. So, so yeah, the question is: Are the character of the um, excited state for the 14, 12 active space the same as for the 12, 9? Uh, yes, yes, they are. As a matter of fact, we can say that for for these excitations here, at least the first bright excited state in all these three cases is. Is, is the same. It's an excitation towards the homo from the same molecular orbital. And this is puzzling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I've also seen in the um, appendix that many of the excited states that um, contributed to the lower energy part of the excitation spectrum are actually double excitations. This is also like a, a little bit weird. I don't know whether this. I mean, since um, yeah, we, well, I did, at least I didn't. I didn't. Um, uh, <coughs> I didn't read out the appendix, so I apologize for this if, uh, oh, if they are there. Okay. But for anthraquinone, do you have as many double excitations as you have for these derivatives in the lower and you really not really excited uh, or the absorption spectrum? Or? For the pristine anthraquinone molecule, yeah. you mean? Uh, Okay, I, I gotta be honest. I did not do the, the capacity of computation with anthraquinone, mm -hmm. the pristine anthraquinone. So I, I, I I, I, I don't know, honestly. But I guess also in the BFT, you don't get oh, okay. double excitations. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, no, no, you don't. No. At least, well, let, let, well let, let, let's talk. I mean, from what I remember, for, for, for the first band, uh, no, you don't get double excitations. No, that's true. Okay. Well, I had one additional question for the other two chapters, but you actually answered them. Okay, thank okay, you yes, very much. Next up, uh, asking questions is going to be uh, Elise uh, Pimo from Lyon. Elise? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, so, first of all, Gustavo, I would like to thank you for, for the nice manuscript and today's presentation. Uh, I'd like also to thank Juan Rolf for the invitation, and I'm truly sorry that uh, COVID has prevented me from being there uh, on site. Um, so it's a very nice, uh, as uh, in essay, I agree, it's, it's really impressive because it's both uh, development that you have done with Mobio tools and also a lot of application. Uh, and I will go through that, but uh, when I met Juan Ro three years ago in a workshop, it was the beginning of your thesis and the beginning of the story. So I'm really happy here to see what, it, what has turned on in the group and what you have done today. Um, so I have a few questions and first perhaps, um, I will not begin by the order, but I will go to the system I know a bit more, the DNA photosensitization. So first I would like to know um, you say in your manuscript that you place the anthraquinone uh, in the insertion mode. So do you have any starting structure or how do you do that to? Uh, this, uh, this I, I did manually, honestly. Uh, so I, I just placed the okay. anthraquinone molecule inside the, inside the binding mode manually. And uh, how do you choose the length of the, the DNA strand? Um, I think it's a decamer, and uh, I was wondering if I you choose is that experimental reason or? Uh, no, no. Uh, but uh, I I agree that uh, yeah, uh, people have actually considered uh, a longer um, longer double double strands basically. Uh, so no, we did not choose the the the. the the land for, let's say, for, for experimental reasons, at least. Ma mainly because, at least, the, the objective of, of this work here, again, was to focus on a specific region like the one uh, of, the, of the neighboring, uh, one of the neighboring uh, uh, nuclear bases. Uh, but yeah, again, this is, this is a simplification. And, and, and of course, uh, yeah, you, would be, you would have a better description of the entire system if you had 
a, a long or double strand, let's say. Um, I would like to know also, uh, I would say that on Trachinon, uh, have you some plan to consider the interaction of the triplet with triplet timing or not? Because I think it's also an interesting property of this photosensitizer. Could you comment on that? Uh, sorry, could, could you repeat, repeat the part of interaction? Yes, uh, on, on Trachinon, so you are trans you have been studying the property of the charge transfer towards guanine, but uh, could you consider other nucleobases that there could also be damage that are important for the photophysics? Uh, yes, in, in principle, I mean, in, in principle, you could. Uh, I mean, in, in our case, we focused on uh, uh, guanine because, uh, well, b because it, it is the, the, the proneness to, uh, well, do, do you know, uh, do you, can you justify the fact that guanine is an interesting nucleobasis to look at, particularly? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't understand. Which it's, other nucleobases are interesting? Yeah, could you justify why guanine indeed is an important one to look at here? What is the like property of guanine with respect to other nucleobases that makes it sensitive? Uh, well, the, the, the main reason also uh, because well, the reason also why we chose it was because it, really, it is prone to oxidation with respect to so it has a, 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 a better red expectation with respect to the, to the other or well, in this case, due to the other three nuclear bases. So that, that's the main reason why why we, we studied it. And I, I think that's the main reason why it is being thoroughly uh, uh, studied. Uh, Do you think with the same uh, computational protocol, you could have a look to, for instance, the triplet property of antrachinone? Because I think that uh, there are some uh, easy population of triplet state and transfer to some other nuclear bases. Is that a something possible with your your strategy um that yeah actually that is that is that would be the most as possible uh, things thing to do because of course uh well uh the anthracinone molecule is is uh, active once it undergoes intersystem process so one should uh uh study well the 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 the, the reaction with the, with the triplet excited state now uh it is whether this is feasible with uh, with the, with the procedure that, that we're adopting here so for, for example of, of course if we wanted to study the intersystem crossing itself uh with anthracnion plus one in like here I, I don't think it would be feasible using a, a multi-reference method to try uh, let's say more speakable uh, you consider uh, inter-system crossing. Um, but one one could consider the, the triplet excited state. So after the uh, the, the, the inter-system cross, uh, crossing process, uh, in a similar fashion as we did here, except that now we have the, 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 the triplet and fragment instead of the, of the, of the single excited, excited states, let's say here. But, but again, in, in that case, yeah, if you want to say, well, the, the entire intersystem process, intersystem crossing process is not feasible by means of, let's say, uh, surface hopping molecular dynamics trajectories because the, the, the time scale for, for, for this to occur is like in the nanosecond time scale. So that wouldn't be a way to go. Uh, yeah, sure. I fully agree. Um, would you have in mind some strategy, and this is in line with the uh, Ines Corral question, uh, if you want to extend the QM size, if you want to have uh, to describe the delocalization on, on several other nucleobases, what could be a method that you would, uh, that you may not have here? Okay, I understand that uh, there is a question of active space if you want to stay at wave function. But if you want to say you don't look at intersystem crossing, but a bit further to the charge transfer, once you have oxidized the guanine, for instance, what QMMM strategy, what flavor, let's say, of QMMM might be of interest here? Uh, I think 
if we include a few nuclear bases in the quantum mechanical region, I think you could you could do so with with time dependent DFT. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, yeah, I think it has been done before in the in the literature where the, the for example the exciton character considering a different uh, nuclear bases. I think it was in the case of a single strand. This was done with time dependent DFT. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it is is computationally feasible. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, there was a an interesting point that you did not show here because of course the manuscript cover morphing. So it's just at some point you look into the effect of the sodium uh, cation and its proximity to the QM part, and I was wondering. Is this uh, some kind of electrostatic effect that could play a role on photophysics? And what are your like thoughts about that? Because it's uh, indeed we forget a little bit that there is a big electrostatic component here that is kind of average over time. But what is there a role of this sodium or not? Or do you have any thoughts about that? Uh... So um, we are we are still focusing on, on this part, right? The the and DNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, uh, yeah. It's like you look at uh, you know the QM part and the the, the Ni plus the sodium and look at its average distances and it's fluctuating quite a lot, which we could expect. Uh, could it be something that could modify the photophysics or or not that much? Uh, I mean it. it in terms of reactivity, I'm pretty sure it could change things because uh, it could, you know, treat change, pol induce polarization and so on. But in terms of photophysics, I just wanted to have if you have a, an opinion about that. I mean, it, it, the, the, the close presence of the point charges to the quantum mechanical region. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that, that, that is a quite difficult question because there are of course several, several factors that could that could uh, uh, that could enter the discussion. First of all, now here uh, we are considering an electrostatic embedding of QMN, so we are we have point charges. Now, if we if a, a point charge gets way too close to it, to the quantum mechanical region, so we, let, let's say need not be sure whether that could be an artifact from the from the dynamics itself that that point charge bit way too close to the, to the QM region so that it over polarizes it and changes the description of the wave function. So, uh, of course, this effect could be, let, let, let's say, uh, diminished if, if we again could include it a larger portion of the system in the QM region, in which cases our, let, let, let's say, molecule of interest, photophysics of the molecule of interest are that of Andrani. You know, if we have it like surrounded by QM atoms, this overpolarization effect could be uh, circumvented, let's say. Okay. Um, I, if, I would like to have other question on the membrane. So first of all, I found it to be uh, really uh, tiny to check at the membrane, uh, inside the photosensitizer insertion into membrane, because I know that sometimes I would say, some experimentalists that I know, they are going to design very beautiful chemical objects, but they are way too big to pass the membrane. So it's always an interesting question. So uh, I would just, uh, you mentioned in your manuscript, and it is really a bit of a naive question from my part, but you mentioned that you have some, uh, you are checking a little bit like in the end, if you have reached equilibration, which for a membrane, I, I'm not doing, I'm not specialist of this modelization, but I guess it's a little tricky. And you mentioned this compressibility, right? And that you are a little bit uh, far from experiment, but uh, could you just tell me a little bit more about that? And try to find the page in the manuscript. Yeah, compressibility sure. modulus, yeah. And uh, I just wanted to know a little more about that. Okay. Uh, I think it was page 160, but it's just what is the compressibility modulus. 
Oh, okay. So, uh, um, it well, it 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 basically well. I don't remember what I had in supporting information, but it, it basically well. Uh, it's just the first line of your manuscript. It's just that well, I never heard this, so I wanted to know a little more. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the, this is this is a quantity that is related uh, with the the permeability uh, to the to the membrane. So this, I mean, on the one hand, it says like how uh, well uh, how, how prone the, the membrane it is to to well. Uh, to the, 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 let's say again, the suffer a compression. But from what I, uh, so in this case here, I think we computed it using the autocorrelation function of the, um, uh, yeah, of the of the of the different snapshots along the the trajectory. Uh, in, in the but, end of a trajectory, after a clip, do you think equilibration is rich or because I suspect this varies quite a lot? No? Sorry, I was wondering if this quantity varies quite a lot because, uh, as you mentioned, indeed, it's it seems that to be a target a little bit hard to reach for the simulation. But it's uh, yeah. Uh, I think it is, it is, if I'm not mistaken, this is the inverse of the diffusion coefficient. So I think it was a quantity. Yeah, so it's was, hard, basically, because the diffusion coefficient, it's not that easy, especially in an environment as heterogeneous, I would say. I, I will have a, a question about that. So if you have a to give an order of magnitude if you want to tell an experimentalist what could be the barrier that makes it impossible uh, physiologically for a drug to enter a membrane, what would be the delta G? Because I guess for here you are from like 6.5 to 8 something, it should, it should be okay with thermal activation, you were at 10 for cisplatin, what is the upper limit that makes it uh, a nice object but not biologically relevant? Um, sorry, sorry, could you repeat the, the, yeah, the, the I'm just thinking, so you have been looking at uh, drugs that are very interesting and uh, you have been finding barriers that are really reasonable that are consistent with the fact that it's possible for this molecule to enter the membrane. What would be the upper limit of uh, delta G that would make it something not as realistic? Because, you know, sometimes people propose big, big photosensitizer with antenna effect, very complicated and beautiful structure. But then the question can be, will it pass the membrane or not? And I'm wondering, do you have any idea of a, a delta G that would be a bit the upper limit? Uh, you mean, for example, uh, 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 Let's see if I like it, yeah, yeah. Like, um, if uh, you you have a compound that is a bit more like bulky, perhaps, uh, and you have to pass through the membrane, and you predict a, a barrier that is like twenty kcal, thirty kcal, would you say it's still feasible or not? Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think now now you got it. So the, if you have like, let's say, yeah, an even more complex structure than these. This guy here, so let's say bulkier or with more degrees of freedom in general. Now, the main problem that you could face is the fact that when you obtain a, a let's enlarge this in here. So, uh, when, when you uh, compute these uh, potentials of mean force, one thing that you uh, need to, well, this is from a very technical point of view, is to, one thing that you need to account for is whether your simulation is converged or not. And of course, the larger the number of degrees of freedom, specifically of the, of the, of the well, let's say of the, of the anti-cancer drug, uh, I think you will require more simulation time to, for, for each of the uh, molecular dynamics, uh, sorry, for each of the, the LSMP simulations. So we need longer and longer and longer uh, trajectories in order for you to get, it, let's say, a converged the free energy profile. With, with so this right. technique, can you add the error bars? to follow the convergence? Do you have error bars on your profile or it's not possible? Uh, 
what uh, I was I just wondering if you have an idea of the error bars or if it's not possible. You could add error bars with respect, yeah, yeah, with, with, with respect to let, 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 let's say an an, uh, mm -hmm. an, uh, an average profile. But the, the the most important thing is that what you could do is, for example, to steer the, uh, the 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 simulations at different uh, time intervals. So. I think we showed that in the case of Cisplan. I, I, I don't have that, that slide here, but, but we did two different convergence analysis. So the first one was to uh, uh, truncating, let's say this, this uh, truncating in the sense of, so considering uh, the molecular dynamic simulations from a different, starting from different uh, points in time. So one nanosecond, two nanoseconds, three, four, and so on, to see at, starting from one point, we have a profile that does no longer change too much. So in that case, you could put some kind of error bar. Mm -hmm. You can see that starting from one point, does the simulation change below that error bar or below a low a threshold? And the second thing that we did there was uh, vice versa to uh, consider the simulation starting from the same point that we saw uh, that in the previous analysis was like the, the point from the, the, the profile was converged. And so uh, how much the profile changed when we truncated the final point, so the final part of the trajectory at different times. So in both cases, yeah, you could, you could see, let's say, what's the interval we can account for so as we have a properly converged profile, let's say. OK. Um... I think I'm like uh, done with what I wanted to ask you. So I would like to congratulate you again you and uh, also for the diversity of all this method that you are trying a bit also to put together with Mobio tools uh, from free energy to excited state. And uh, it's really an impressive piece of work. And uh, congratulations again, Gustavo. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Liz. So the next uh, one to intervene is, is Basil from Bristol. All right. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Perfect. All right. Uh, great. So, um, so, so, yeah, thank you super very much for, uh, for your thesis. Uh, I think I, I want to, to second uh, everybody uh, on, on what they mentioned. So I had really, a, it was really a great pleasure to read your work. Yeah. Um, great diversity in the things that you've been doing. And what I really appreciate is the fact that you went for it, right? So you really tried to kind of get very, very complex type of systems and address questions with QMMM uh, that really, I mean, principal people are scared to try. So, I mean, really congratulations for that. Um, I, I very much enjoy also yeah, reading the, the manuscript. I just, there was just a, a few little things with equations or whatever, but really that was just absolute details. So really congratulations. And all the questions that I have here, I mean, Let's see, the, the one that I have left, because we had quite a few overlap with, <laughs> with what Elise and Ines have, have asked. Um, so the really curiosity, right? It's just, just like to have a sort of scientific chat together. So there is nothing like probing or whatever. There's gonna be just very naive questions. And I just would like to kind of pick your brain on some of the, the, this context. So, so um, I think one of the first question that I have for you perhaps um, is so when you compute this, uh, this absorption spectrum, you will see I, I will be mostly like on the photophysics part, right, of, of your PhD, right? Um, yes. When, 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 you, when you compute this absorption spectra, so, so you, you go up to using like some super high level method like msk 2 for example, and, um, uh, and you base that on MM structures, right, that you got from a sampling. Yes. How yes. much does the underlying structure that you obtain affect the spectra. In other words, if you were to be like super computationally rich <laughs> and have the opportunity to relax your QMM geometries to kind of have the QM geometry that correspond to your MSCAS PT2 say, I mean, what would be the effect of that? And how maybe also this, this overall uh, protocol limit your exploration of the configuration space that could be the one that you would have if you were to do QMM with PT2 as a sampling strategy. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so 
Yeah, well, sorry, I, I guess I'm showing the wrong picture. So in, in this particular case, like the case of the main benchmark, yeah, these, these are the QMMM optimized structures. But apart, apart from that, for, for, for the rest of the thesis, indeed, those are, uh, yeah, molecular, uh, so force field structures, let's say. Um, the, the main issue there is the fact that when we fetch these structures and we then perform a QMMM computation on top of them, of course, there we are not going to be consistent with the level of fear. We're, we're going to be a, a different minima of the potential energy surface. So this is, again, indeed in already a, a, a source of errors. Uh, let's say well, one, one could do several different things. One of, one of the things would be, for example, to use one uh, quantum mechanical level of theory, like, for example, in this case, where we used, I think it was MP2, to, well, just to optimize the geometry, but you could perform QMMMMD with, let's say, uh, MP2 again, and then compute the absorption spectra with a different method. There, however, we, we would be in a similar situation because we wouldn't be consistent with the, with the level of uh, theory. One, of course, would guess that um, by um, performing QMMMMD and then computing the spectra on top of those structures, one would be more accurate because this is, I mean, it's, it's a better level of the year. The main problem there is the capabilities that you have in, with, the, with the, the, the computational resources to sample the, 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 the configurational space, in particular, the time scale that you can cover. So the main problem there is to perform QMMMMD, you could get at most tens of picoseconds with already demanding computational resources. The thing that, on the other hand, uh, is, uh, let's say, a piece of cake for molecular dynamics, for classical molecular dynamics, because these are uh, trajectories to the order of hundreds of nanoseconds, and you can obtain them within days, let's say. So this is one great caveat for the QMMM uh, protocol, the, 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 the time scale. Now, it works really well for small systems. You get to tens, even hundreds of of, of picoseconds, but when you are increasing the size of the system, it is, of course, you need longer time scales just to relax the system, let alone to start sampling the, well, in, in our case, the, 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 the yeah, the, the configurational space. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely, I agree. And also, I mean, a lot of your molecules are quite rigid, right? So I guess that they will also be quite nicely, like uh, any of the, the, the fulfillment for for a force field or something like that but the, but the just out of curiosity uh, I, for like say a gas phase geometry have you tried just to get the mm optimized geometry for one of your molecule and then say optimize it with say a gas pt2 or mp2 and just compare one to one what would be the different spectra or do you know if any if some work i'm some people should have perhaps tried that but uh, I, I, it was just just out of curiosity to know if this has been studied because it's quite interesting uh, maybe maybe it's useless maybe it doesn't make any difference and you save a great deal of time but uh, i was just wondering if there was a reference for that so uh i i think that, that there there might be works but i mean I, I, i'm most i mean i'm confident that, that there are i'm not aware of, of them right now mm -hmm. uh so well, so when, when, when you compute the absorption spectra now, of course, you're relying there on uh, well, your computing energy differences. So well, in principle, you could get lucky, and for the MM structure, you could get a very similar spectrum than for the CAS CP2 spectra, sorry, for the CAS CP2 structure. But this would be just out of, let's say, uh, error cancellation somehow, and a piece of luck. Uh, the, 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 the main problem there again is that uh, with the EMM structure, you're not at the, I mean, if you optimize the geometry, you're not actually at the, at the, at the mean. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, the, the, the other question that I would have, of course, in the context of QMMM, in particular for, um, for um, uh, absorption spectra, is um, so, so it, 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 tell me if I'm wrong, right? But my understanding is that in all your work, um, for any, in particular, like if I look at the, the, the figure that you have here, uh, you, you've been considering the, the chromophore in the QM part, and of course, like removing anything that is there, um, which has a major limitation that you don't account for the fast polarization of the solvent, right? 
uh, have you by chance check what would be the influence of actually, and I would think in particular, for example, for this case that you have here, what would be the influence of say, adding some solvent molecule in your QM parts, just to kind of see what would be this, uh, the influence of this solvent, right? Uh, yeah. Um, okay, well, well the, the, the first thing is that the, the, the thing that you mentioned that within electrostatic embedding, of course, we're not considering the polarization of, of, of the solvent due to the, to the solute, let's say. Uh, so if you included a few molecules in the 2M region, uh, yeah, we, we, you, you could account for uh, that, uh, let's say, polarization effect. Now, um, uh, let's say, so yeah, I, I don't know what the, the question is, what would happen with the excitation? Oh, I yeah, I mean, I, I was just wondering if by chance you tried something like that. So, so yeah, oh, I mean, okay. I think I went too far in my question because it was a leading <laughs> question. I'm sorry for that. Um, no. uh, so, so I think I think my my my, my question was also more um, if you you make this choice of just focusing on the QM part because you knew that basically it was giving a, a, a mostly a good description because electrostatic was the important contribution, or if by chance you 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 had try you mentioned that you did some some DFT and TDDFT calculation on that. So where I, re, I reckon like now adding more molecules around would be like a a bit more of a piece of cake as compared to. <laughs> Um, to to to, uh, to, uh, to a PT two level of theory, uh, have you tried something like that? Have you tried to see what would be the influence of adding more QM molecules around? Uh, no, I, I haven't. I haven't tried that. Now, okay. I think you you, you could, of course, within the, the class PT two level of theory, that would be terribly terribly unfeasible. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know. You you, you could get uh, different fashions of of, of an embedding. Again, you could, for example, have I don't know QM QM MM. For example, in which case you could include some of the of the solvent molecules at a QM region, but at a different level of theory. And uh, yeah, you, you could see these polarization effects, and you, you could see what happens. But no, I, I haven't I haven't tried that. Okay, Sorry. okay, just no, no, just out of curiosity, yeah. Um, Okay, uh, I will have questions related to the thing that you have on your slide, but I think I just would like to come to um, to, to your algorithm for preservation of the active space. So, I mean, needless to say that when I saw this paper appearing, I jumped on my chair because that's really a big problem. And I think that, uh, uh, I mean, congratulations on, on on working on this problem because it will be super useful for a lot of people. So, so now that I managed to have you in front of me, I can ask you a few questions that I had. <laughs> um, um, uh, so yeah, that's perfect. That's exactly the slide that I wanted. Um, so, uh, so, so, just one, one, one super naive question, and it's possible that I mean, it, you, it's not happening on when you just do ground state sampling. But so, in the, in the example that you show here, um, if I look at the, uh, the, the 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 reference MOs four and five, uh, you see a very clear cut, right? There's a switch, right? Um, in other words, the character of the orbital itself hasn't changed much, such that you can really look at them. And I know that you've been discussing some more invo involved algorithm. Uh, but ju just for me to understand and to make sure that I understand properly the your algorithm, say that imagine that you have um, now a, a molecular orbital that is quite well defined uh, in the reference, a lone pair, this pretty isolated. And now in your dynamics, there's a bit of flexibility, and this lone pair mix is not just or d does not just exchange, but say it starts to mix with say two or three other orbitals, right? Uh, due to distortion. So you match the, the off-diagonal matrix sediment that you would have there are not just 0, 08 or 0, 07, but would be a smaller number, but still a trace that actually they, they, they're there. How do you deal with that? Because you always want to conserve the same number of orbitals in your active space, right? So yeah. so, so uh, I, I couldn't, I, uh, I'm sorry if I'm, uh, but I, I couldn't just figure out in, 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 your, in, your, in your workflow <laughs> how this would be uh, dealt with. Uh, and if it's a sort of like successive, use of this that will kind of bring back the orbital to one on the orbital or how would you deal with that? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the, the, this is true. The, the, the thing that, that you said could indeed I mean, happen, I mean, it happens more, more often than not. Than not. Uh, then, yeah, this is of course a convenient picture that I shot, but this is not the thing that I... <laughs> but it's making the point it's perfect. <laughs> but yeah, of course you, you could have uh, a admixture I and mean, contribute an admixture of different molecular orbitals, especially when you have intruder molecular orbitals, 
So the the main point there is well, of course you, you could take a look at uh, the well the, the maximum values of the of the of the columns. Let's say so the maximum values of the absolute of the of the overlap matrix. And uh, uh, yeah, the, the, when whenever a situation like that happens. The main issue is that you could have, for example, even though, I mean, you could have like uh, two values that are close to one another. So you think, but do, do, do you do, do I actually have to to make the swap or or, or not? what what do I do? So um, well, well, first of all, is eventually identifying those orbitals because if you look at the just at the column maxima, well, you don't know. I mean, you just take the maximum and that's it. So for example, you 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 see like 0 0.5 and 0 0.48 or or, or mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, this is this is this is actually a really a really tricky situation because uh, yeah the, the, this is an oversimplification. In, in reality, the, the the algorithm does not just uh, consider the column maxima, but it also considers the row maxima. Yeah, yeah. This is the, this is the part. I just wanted to make sure that I understood what this part in uh, because um, yeah, what, what does it imply in this context? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I guess I guess I don't, I don't have it here. But sorry. Uh, yeah. So so in that case, it also considers the, the row maxima. So so as to identify which sampled uh, orbital is the most similar to each one of the reference orbitals. Mm -hmm. So one first thing that it sees is whether two rows and or columns. So two uh, uh, sampled orbitals are similar to the same orbital. Mm -hmm. uh, that, 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 that's, that, that's kind of, of problematic because this is one, one, one factor you can see here. If, uh, so so the, the most naive thing would just be, okay, so since the maximum is actually inside the active space, then we do not do the swap. But if the maximum is, is outside, we do the swap. Now, another thing, of course, that this row analysis does is, of course, to look for let's say complementary molecular orbitals that need to be well uh, taken care of outside of the active space. So uh, what you do is, of course, you consider the, the 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 number of orbitals that need to be taken outside and the number of orbitals that need to put inside. So this is this is a less quantitative analysis in the sense that, for example, you have two orbitals that need to be removed, but one orbital that needs to be put inside. Well, the simplest case scenario is just to choose the one that has well let's say the lowest of the two values, the one that has the lowest value, the one that needs to be swapped. Mm. The, the main issue there is because you're you're supposing that there is a bijection between these. Yeah, yeah, these. yeah, absolutely. Need, need not be the case. So this is like less like a, a less quantitative analysis, and more like a, a like a, a an empirical like, not like guess whether you actually swapped the right orbital. Uh, so yeah. These are really complicated situations. Yeah. But then if I just want to play David's advocate, right? And sorry for that, it's just to make sure. But if, because now you, you, you always consider the two, two orbitals, right? But now th think that actually your, your N is, is spread over three orbitals, right? Um, so, the, so what your algorithm will do at the moment with just to pick somehow the maximum of this three orbital in terms of overlap and try to bring it in the active space, right? Yeah, exactly. So, for okay. example, if you have two problematic orbitals here, but only but you have identified after analyzing the rows and the columns, and you have only identified this one to be put inside the active space. Well, you choose just the, 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 let's say the one that has the the, the, the lowest value out of the two problematic ones. And you say, yeah. okay, uh, yeah, that may be the most problematic one. So, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good. And and um, so 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 yeah, so so this tool that you have yeah you have it in this context. I was just thinking, so in the context of like photochemistry using this CASSCF or like active space methods, uh, I think your tool actually in itself would be extremely useful to the community. Um, in particular, when you have to capture in your active space orbitals that are not really willing to stay there in the context of the Franconian region, say sigma sigma star, because you have photo dissociation and these kind of things. So, I mean, if, if very often what you would do is to stretch a bone, capture your, your orbital in your active space, and then in a very, very, very small st step and praying that it remains there, trying to kind of bring back your active space to the original Franconian region, right? Uh, 
I mean, have you considered just using that? Because that would be amazing because then you kind of define all the orbitals that would be your reference, say for a stretch geometry, and then you let your algorithm choose within all the orbital, which one are the important one in the front and region and this problem solved. I mean, I would buy this software for quite a lot of money, I think sometimes. So, um, so I don't know, have, have you considered to kind of generalize it like to, as, as a general support, not just for this context, but uh, I think uh, as, as just a little tool that you could have for anybody to, to use uh, outside of um, the, I mean, maybe this term bio would kind of scare me if I see it somewhere. <laughs> So I don't know if, I, I mean, have, have you used it in other contexts, like uh, like in this context, say, of photochemistry or studying something like that, or it's been like mostly used for this, uh, for this context of uh, absorption spectra? Uh, I, I think, I think in the, you could also use it in some other contexts. This is also in line with a question that did Ines before. So you, you could also use it in the, in the context of, of uh, yeah, uh, of, of photochemistry. <laughs> Uh, I haven't done so, but I, yeah, I, I, I would also like eventually to, to, to do that in future in future work. Um, okay. Now I, got, I gotta say, I, I gotta be humble at this point. This is this is now this, this is no longer the only the only algorithm that does this, and that there, there are there are some other uh, publications outside that do similar things. Uh, one is actually in the context of precisely, for example, reactivity. Well, this is, I, I think it is, yeah, it's photochemistry. It was actually a paper from 2020 from Sandra Luber in which they did something slightly different. So they, instead of comp computing the overlap matrix, what they did was to uh, uh, compare the atomic orbital uh, coefficients. But in that context, instead, well, what you wanted to get was like, for example, a converged uh, active space along, for example, a minimum RG pathway. So that, that is slightly different because you gradually increase or decrease eventually the, the active space. So, uh, but I, I think a, com a, a combination of several tools could be the, the perfect match there because there are also some other things that do, for example, automatic uh, selection of the active space, like the autocast method from Marcus Reiter. But uh, I, I think the tools that are outside are somehow complementary. So I, I think the, the, well, the, the mobile tools could get inside, uh, inside, inside the cloud, let's say. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you super much. Um, so, so, my, so, so my nice two questions are maybe just a bit more about the technicalities and maybe also some of the benchmark of the calculation that you've been doing. So um, in, in the part of your PhD where you work on the anthracinone and, and, um, and, and DNA interaction, um, uh, if, so if I remember well, so, so, so you use CAMB3 as a functional, if I remember well. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, for for um, considering that you have a sort of stacking or at least some interaction between uh, between two region and maybe that this interaction might be important, uh, have you investigated the effect of dispersion in this in this uh, in this context? Dispersion interactions that I guess can get, can be three D will not account for. Uh, no, no, no. It it doesn't. Uh... <laughs> the, the the main reason why we chose can be three was because it had yeah, the, the the long range correction. Now mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, of course the different functional south side like the omega b ninety seven xc which yeah, I was thinking about this one yeah 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 which actually includes the the dispersion correction like implicitly in the sense with, with, within the structure of the functional itself. So in that case you don't need you wouldn't need to put let's say a, a, a dispersion correction on top of, of the uh, empirical dispersion correction on top of your computations. Uh, so honestly, we I think we did not uh, we did not we did not emphasize the, 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 the dispersion effect in that in that work. The reason why we chose the Cambi Prelib was because a benchmark had been done like back in 2013 uh, with several different functionals accounting for charge transfer. Um, I think it was from Stefan uh, Tupper, which, uh, uh, yeah, they, 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 they well, they, 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 I think they, they benchmark different functionals whereby they uh, consider the, the charge transfer, uh, both long, long range correct and not, and well, they saw that they can be really um, take the best there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you, uh, you, you, you can do that. We, we didn't do that, but yeah, you, you have all the functions yeah. in the market. 
to have in place this, this no no problem it was it was just a curiosity right really so it was just to kind of know um and 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 so all these calculations were done in the full linear response to the dft formalism right you haven't tried the timeline of approximation or something like that is that correct no, no, we did, yeah we did we did not use uh the the, the time bank of approximation so okay yeah this was uh, yeah and, and 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 just 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 based on this um so I think that on your slide 37, you have one of these plots. I was thinking not about the density of states, but more the, the, the absorption spectra that you are, that you are, had in your PhD. Um, yeah. And so so here, so you show this band, and I was quite interested in knowing what was the character. I mean, what I mean, I mean. So in the, I think you also have it in the absorption spectra. It's in the in the figure seven point four in the, in in your thesis. Um, but um, the, you have this this really low energy contribution here, um, uh, even in the absorption spectra, right? And I was just wondering, how come they are so low energy? What's happening there? Uh, because I mean, they they almost it's almost scary how low energy they are. <laughs> so is, that, it that, that in, is it because they're very very close, or uh, I, I couldn't really rationalize this this part? And I don't think you mentioned. Uh, what triggers this kind of low energy? Like, I think that if I'm not mistaken, you have something with a CT character that is yeah between zero and one EV in the absorption spectra. Did you do you know which? Uh, I mean, what, what's the reason for this low energy? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know for sure. In the sense that this this was something that we we explored. Actually, mm -hmm. well, this is the dose, but yeah, this is this is the density of states. But I think those states are, uh, yeah, this. These are the, the 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 same that that are in, in the yeah, absorption. It, it looks very much the same, right? I think uh, yeah. it's the same energy. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so because this stuff between I mean, zero and say one point five, I was just wondering what what they could be because that's really low energy. So is it because I don't know the things that yeah I had had to just uh, to do to realize what what could happen here uh, to me. So I was just wondering if you had some a feeling or some interpretation for that, or if there's another process that or, or another thing that's happening there that would explain this. Uh, I think, I mean, honestly, because this is yeah, this is this is this is of work indeed. So my first guess is uh, that these are I mean because all all these are again classical. Uh, geometries. So mm. this is mm -hmm. associated with the fact that we are we are just uh, using force field obtained uh, geometries. So uh, I, I, yeah, I would also say that there is something weird behind there. So one, uh, I, I should have taken a further look, perhaps, at the at the at the geometries in these in these right. regions. So, it, was, it was it was it was just a curiosity, just to know what was happening at this tail. And uh, yeah, yeah, okay, no, no problem. <laughs> if by chance you you had look uh, you looked at that, and um, um, so not no, just for the chapter eight. Um, so so I mean. You, you, you've you've been already a bit grilled on this, but I'm just gonna add an extra layer on it if you don't mind. I mean, it's, it's just a provocative thought because I realize how difficult it should have been to include this, to, um, to do this study, bringing them in the membrane and everything. But um, my, 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 uh, when I was reading that, my 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 only uh, my, my my main thought was when you were doing your benchmark and you looked at your active space. Um, uh, if you can just go back to this figure that we, we were looking at just earlier. Yeah, yeah this one. Um, so, so first of all, I mean, I understand that on the long time run, you want to do the intersystem crossing part, but I was just, uh, yeah. So, so you said that you did also some TDDFT. Have you tried to do some, it, it seemed to be very, very complex way of looking and, and, and trying to determine the good active space where you, you have so many parameters that can go wrong that it's really hard to know what was, was the best strategy. So I was just wondering, if, if have you done some gas phase calculation on this typical molecule, so on tracking-on-based molecule, in the gas phase and compare them uh, like using, I don't know, ADC2 and perhaps you could even fit a EOMC CSD or something like that to have some sort of known value for which you can basically match an active space in the gas phase or something like that before going to the, the full craziness of, uh, <laughs> of, of of this setup. So I, I don't know if do, do you have like some, have you done some some gas phase calculation in the first place? Uh, some, yeah, g g gas phase, yeah, but then again, <laughs> well, only with, with, the, with the same methodology, just to see how, well, how the spectra changes. Because, well, uh, yeah, I, I, have, I have been doing like a lot of things with these systems. I've tried 
like well apart from the from the optimized geometries mm -hmm. in uh, uh, to MMMB also with uh, PCM, which mm -hmm. I have found out that it's quite uh, awkward how to properly do uh, cast PT2 computations with the PCM because of the state average stuff and, and, and things. And, but uh, well, that's space and PCM doing some comparisons. Haven't obtained the, 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 the reproduce the spectrum, the, 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 the experimental spectrum. But the suggestion you gave me is actually is actually awesome. I mean, yeah, but that would that would really be one way to go, like to to first uh, get like let's say a initial reference with an ABC2 computation. Yeah, I would go with uh, it. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, this is this is really really a, a good suggestion. Like trying that or I mean that no, sorry. There are also methodologies where you can like use crazy uh, active spaces. Like for example, include the, the twenty or twenty two eighteen. I don't remember. Yeah. In active space, it would be DMRG or stuff like that. I th yeah, I, th I, th yeah, I, th I think that uh, I mean because you said that there is no dub double excitations, right? As much as you could see. Yeah. So I think I think that then there is nothing preventing you from hammering it with a good ADC two, with a good basis set, to have a good or even CC two or whatever, but just to have. A, a vague idea and see if they're already CC2, ADC2, and I don't know, they kind of agree on the on the character of the bands. And then at least you know what to expect. Get it in the gas phase and then have a validation where you have much less um where you have much less of a viability um due to the, the system itself, right? And uh and 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 at least then you can you can sleep better at night knowing that your active space <laughs> matched match the the actual uh, or original part so 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 all all these calculations were done with a state average 10 right i think it's from the si or like for, for the annex you 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 wrote something like that is, is that correct or, or uh, did, did, sorry, uh, I, did, I didn't understand the last part you, oh sorry the... sorry uh, so how many states did you add in your state averaging was it 10 oh yeah yeah it was it was 10 10 yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean. I. So. 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 I mean. Yeah. I mean. I, it, it was just just a proposition because I, I was kind of. Uh, uh, I mean, it was really nice to see that then when you add the effect of the sampling, you actually reproduce this kind of very very sort of broad bands, right? So. 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 And I was just wondering. So. So. Could you get a, a feeling? Yeah. Exactly. You. You have this kind of like broad distribution starting to appear. So is that really just an environment effect, or or like um, uh, so 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 because it's pretty impressive, right? That you get that, and that's really like very very exciting to see that, right? Uh, from like um, what appears not to be a forest of transitions, but like a few transitions that start to be changing so much in energy. So I don't know. I mean, um, uh, so, so could you extract the the gist out of this? Of uh, um, like like what what uh, I mean. Uh, how to kind of rationalize in a better way, like what, what's the kind of broadening effect coming from in the first place? Um, maybe I missed that. it. Maybe I missed it, right? That's, I'm, it's highly possible that I missed this part. <laughs> uh, I, I think... Um, oh, okay, yeah, the, the, main, the main problem here is we, we, we do see a problem, for example, in the in the, in the very first excitation that we have, right? Why are browning with respect to the, to the experiment? Now, it, of course, it is true that this is the spectrum in the membrane, whereas this one is the spectrum <coughs> chloro from the, the, the experimental spectrum. Uh, I mean, I think that there, there, there might be a, a, a maple of, of, of reasons why we have, for example, again, like the problem that we observed in, in anthracium. Now, we know that uh, when we, I mean, when we include an ensemble of geometries, what we are trying to do is to account for the so-called vibronic excitations in the sense that we are not just including the vertical excitation between two uh, excited states, but also between two uh, vibrational states associated with each one. Of the excited states. Now, of course, this is the quantum mechanical picture here. We're getting classical uh, trajectories, so we are emulating this, this thermal broadening. But, uh, but yeah, but, but apart from that, I mean, again, the, the problem here is that we have classical geometries. Mm -hmm. And another problem here is that, well, we have 100 geometries. Well, in which case, what you say, yeah, OK, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a, a, a quite large number. But 
but on the other hand, on the other hand, what would happen if we, uh, let's say, let's say, put ten times more geometries? I, I think, I mean, the, this band would be, maybe, I mean, would would become slightly slightly thicker in the sense that it would more focus more at the center of the membrane. And what we would have here, the especially these guys here, would be, I don't know, uh, like again, problematic geometries due to the fact that we are in the classical world. I mean, we are describing the geometries classically, and. Uh, that, that that is again my my guess. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was just yeah, I mean, I was just positively surprised to see that you get such a broadening already from there, right? So it's uh, it was really like uh, very interesting. So um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think I'm gonna stop here with my question, but I just would like to say congratulations again, uh, and 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 super sorry that um, I yeah I couldn't be uh, with you to kind of shake your hands and say well done on a on a super 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 nice work. And uh, yeah, thank you also for all your answers to my questions. Thank you, Basil. Now back to Madrid. Now <laughs> we'll start with Okay, so first of all, congratulations. So I really enjoyed uh, reading your thesis. Thank you. So I learned also a lot, and that's quite nice. So I just want to say that I really appreciate because you spend a lot of time, I think, writing the thesis because it's really carefully, carefully written. So there are few errors. And I really appreciate what you did because I understand that you have all these papers, but you try to merge the format of the PDF, the published articles to the thesis. So I really appreciate because sometimes there's a PDF and it's not easy to, to see the figures. So this the small errors of the nomenclature of the figures is because of that. So sometimes you keep the, yeah, the name of the, the number of the figure of the manuscript, but I really appreciate it. And uh, also, I really like your thesis because it's complete. And also, <laughs> it reveals, so it shows the problematics we usually find, and you haven't hidden them. You face with them, and you create these tools to facilitate everybody's work, because it's true that just uh, working with MD and QMM sometimes it's not easy. And so your tools are going to be quite useful for everybody. So, okay, just to, um, some questions, curiosities. Yeah. So just starting with the mobile tools. So, okay, it's, uh, your tool just to generate the QMM inputs. So I think it's quite versatile because you did it for a lot of software. But I yep. uh, have one question. So in the um, projects, the studies that you have presented here in your thesis, so always the QM part is not linked to the ML part. So can we use this uh, tool in case in the cases where the QM part is covalently linked to the ML part? This is this is a, a, a great question. Uh, for the time being, I mean, if you went to the, to the uh, GitHub and downloaded it, uh, you could. In the sense that the, for the time being, there is no accounting for the the, the QMMM boundary. Uh, I, I'm working on that right now, and and, and it, it will be possible, hopefully next week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what what we want to adopt there uh, is uh, well. Basically, the, the this is straightforward approach of, of using a link atom, so basically putting like a hydrogen atom between the QM in, in the center, more or less, of the of the bond, and then smearing somehow the, the, the point charges that account for all the truncation. So this this will come out in the future. So yeah, I I gotta confess, uh, actually, two referees uh, told us that uh, this was a big flaw, uh, which and they are totally right because. I mean, there are really important situations where you do have to account for the QMMM boundary. So we are working on that. Yeah, yeah. It's also because sometimes the format of the, how to give the hydrogen link atom depends a lot on the software. Yeah. So it's yeah. not that easy to do. Yeah, yeah the, the, there are different uh, uh, flavors of, or even of link atoms. Yeah. So. Okay, so just keeping here, uh, it was not clear for me after reading this part of the thesis, 
So you can add some solvent molecules to the kilon part, but I, I read, you said, that of course, during the empty simulations, the number of diversity of these solvent molecules can change. So how, because it, I, I saw that you have the closest keyword. Yeah. So how do you select these solvent molecules that you can add in the kilon part? Um, so it's a cutoff? Or it is, yeah, it is, it is some kind of cutoff in the sense of the, um, so, well, it, this, this, uh, this toolkit uh, also calls and uses this uh, so-called CPP trash uh, software. So it uses this closest feature from CPP trash. So uh, what it does is looks for uh, a number of, uh, let's say, of these atoms present in different uh, solvent molecules. The first one to the number of, let's say, closest molecules, depending on, on the on the value that you have set. Um, so it, it's yeah, it's, it's a kind of cutoff. It looks for atoms that are that are, It looks for for the nearest neighbors, let's say. So if you say uh, I want to put the, the the closest ten molecules in the QM region, so look for the nearest neighbor or residues that are around. Uh, now the problem of the of the trajectory. Indeed, uh, along the trajectory, of course, uh, you, you don't have a radius cutoff because if that were if it were just a radius, then yeah, it's really likely that the number changes. So instead, for each one of the of the snapshots, since you want to be consistent with the number of QM uh, residues that you're including from the solvent, uh, it looks the close, the nearest neighbors instead. So it's not a, a radial cutoff, but uh, a nearest neighbor. Um, search. Okay, because I think it's also typical. So in these cases, when you want the sampling and I don't know, compute a given property, so you want to keep the same plan part. So for instance, here you have I don't know six six uh, solvent molecules. You want this this only six solvent molecules in every snapshot. So I think this is the tricky because sometimes perhaps you, there's another solvent molecule coming close. Yeah. And in this, for this snapshot, your kilo region is bigger because you have seven seven molecules. So that's also difficult to start. Okay, so just a curiosity in figure 3.8, I mean, if you have yeah. So this is the the spectra of oxidancy. Yes. So why in the part in the region around 500 nanometers? So I, I'm used to see only one band, and here you have two different bands. So in general, these bands correspond to the N5 star transitions. Why do you have these two small contributions there? So there are different conformations or uh, um, I, I, yeah, I, I think they are associated with the different conformations, but I have, I have to be 100% honest with this yeah. spectrum. I, I didn't do it. The, in, in, indeed, the, this paper was done in conjunction with the entire group, and that, that was uh, it actually a bit of part of the work. But uh, so, yeah, I, I, I I'm quite confident that the, 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 these are these are two different uh, conformations, two different geometries that produce these. <laughs> we did not take a look at the, at the at the character of the excited states, especially in that region. That okay. yeah, this but might I mean, be the case. That region should be an by start also because of the oscillator strength. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you. So let's yes, going to the next uh, chapter. Okay. So the magic uh, <laughs> 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 tool. So I, I really think it's quite useful. So for instance, me, I had a lot of problems with when doing the scans. It was really a nightmare that the scanning and the rotation of a dihedral angle. So you, you yes. just want to keep the same uh, active space, space for all the points. And for instance, this tool could be also useful not only for something, something but also just to do a scan with uh, the same active space. And also, I think it could be also interesting not just to try to keep the same active space, but just to know 
for instance, when you when you compute a minimum energy path, mm -hmm. at which point this active space is changing because at that point perhaps it's starting a different code chemistry or another coordinate it's been activated. Yeah. So just a suggestion. So perhaps this tool can be modified on one path that check include this part. So just to to show mm -hmm. when the active space is changing yeah. and give some clue about the photochemistry of the, of the system. I don't know, I think it's, it's quite useful and that you can retrieve really valuable information about, the, about it. So just keep working on it. I mean, because it's really useful for <laughs> the photochemistry. You know. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, the, the, this is a great suggestion. The, yeah. uh, so it's just when I faced that problems and I saw this, I said, okay, that's so quite useful. <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah. I, I will be working on these yeah. for sure for a long time. So this, is, this is a great suggestion. Thank you. So, okay. So just going to chapter five. Because I'm starting with the, with the layer. So there's one thing you rationalize in the manuscript that then I don't understand with the one figure. So it's page 165. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So here, it's around the middle of the page. Okay. So you say that the um, lifetime of the inter intermolecular contacts is between 6 and 10 for the minimum. It's just in the middle of the page. 165. Uh, uh, okay, okay. The light channel So for minimum, yeah. it's between 6 and 10, and for the, the top, it's between 4 and 6. And six. Yeah. So and if you go to the next page, so figure 5.4, so the first column, it's between 4 and 6, and the second, it's between 6 and 10. So the thing is that the second column is the top. So I don't know if it's just a uh, misleading to the configuration. So, <laughs> because for me, it's the other way around in the figure. So I don't know if it's just an error okay. of uh, okay. assigning the minimum and uh, the top in the figures or the other way around. But, um, yeah, yeah. Just is. check in case it's important. That this is, yeah, this is, this is, this is. Could be just an error yeah. of like, the minimum. But for me, it was like, okay. <laughs> really confusing. <laughs> yeah, this, this is typo. Sorry, sorry, sorry mm -hmm. for that. It's okay. So, okay, yes, um, once you finish this chapter, so with uh, the results you have, because you analyze these interaction energies in mm -hmm. terms of the, these two types, which information to retrieve from, from that? So, what's new? So, what have we learned about this system? This is that new. And interaction with the bilayer. Can we change uh, the structure of this to, to enhance the interaction or? Um, yes, yes. The, the, the let's say the, the main goal there is is precisely to know what the 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 nature of the interactions let's say uh, is uh, along the entire permeation pathway. Um, so um, well, the, here everything was was really well, wrapped up was was summarized into electrostatic and non-electrostatic contributions. But in in this case, we did let's say also uh, uh, more let's say thorough analysis on the contribution of uh, let, let, let's say the interactions with each one. Of, uh, I'm increasing it, the size of this figure. Okay, so so yeah, what, what we also did there was to characterize the the, the nature of the of the inter so the, the the composition of the interaction energies between the the cisplatin molecule and each one of these fragments of the DOPC uh, molecule in the membrane. So here we have like uh, this zwitterionic part, the the the, the calling a phosphate. Then we have the glycerol, and then we have the oleal part. So the information that we get is is first of all. Uh, well, we, we have the general, uh, the, 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 gener the energetics of the of the, of the potential of mean force of the uh, well, of the permeation profile. So the first thing that we know is more or less uh, 
where the minimum the minimum of this profile happens to be. The second thing is uh, once we know, like let's say, the nature of the interactions between these fragments. Uh, yeah, and, and not only that, but who are, let's say, the, the atoms that contribute to each one of the, the components of the interaction? Yeah, we, we can propose further functionalizations of this molecule. Now, cisplatin, um, yeah, let's see, cisplatin is the precursor of, of a whole family of, of platinum, uh, platinum two and molecules, but also platinum four. So in those cases, in reality, the cisplatin, or well, the cisplatin derivatives, the platinum two derivatives, are the, 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 the active molecules. But sometimes, well, they're let's say way too active in the sense that they, they kill pretty much everything. Almost this is bad. So uh, instead, platinum four precursors, which have an octahedral, let's say, a, a geometry, are used because they are more inert. So. Um, the information that we can get, at least from this work, is first of all, uh, well, the, the, what's, what's the greatest contribution in each, in each one of the regions, and in particular in the minimum region? Is it electrostatic or non electrostatic? Who are the, the, the molecules, the, the functional groups that contribute towards those interactions? We want to make them more favorable, more favorable because we want them to, I mean, we want this line to. to, to stay here eventually or we want for example it to, to, to permeate so uh, another suggestion which are the contributions that are more unfavorable and who are the functional groups that contribute to those unfavorable contrib uh, contributions so that we can lower the barrier now this regards the active molecule but the, the, this is platinum itself but something that could be done would be also to, to study uh, the precursors of platinum four and uh, Usually those precursors are done, uh, so they have the two extra functional groups above and below, and we have these equatorial uh, groups here, which are the same. So, uh, so yeah, we, we, we know, for example, what are the interactions that maybe make this barrier high. We would like to lower this barrier so we can the derivatives permeate more easily. And, uh, and, uh, and yeah, in, in general, in general, what are the, the uh, what's what's the nature of the interaction which with each one of these groups here? Uh, yeah. So it's yes, clear that once you have a clue about the interactions, perhaps for the octahedral geometries, you can just uh, guide which type of substituents groups you can put there. Yeah. To enhance the interaction with some groups. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so chapter seven. So I'm talking about in DNA. So I, I just have curiosity. So just analyzing, yeah, perfect. Analyzing the, the geometry of Antrochinum. So it's completely symmetric. In it. no? uh, okay. So it's symmetric. So you have the symmetry in there. So analyzing this uh, graph you have here, so you have uh, some snapshots which you have around zero, right? mm -hmm. and another one which it's around 180. Mm -hmm. So this means that the two vectors are parallel or just the other way around. Mm -hmm. So why? So just analyzing the geometry of antrochinon and if it's symmetry, these two populations of these two types of class of snapshots should be equivalent. So, I mean, why putting them tracking on like this or the other way around to give different, uh, and it's different because if not, you should have a symmetric population so that it's for at least the same number of snapshots in yeah. one part or the other. So I, I don't know where it comes, the part of the structure could be from the MN part, which makes non-equivalent these two conformations. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it, because um, uh, uh, I gotta, I gotta say, I, I lied a little bit in, this, in the sense of calling them symmetrical. I don't lie in the sense, I, this is an oversimplification, but uh, yeah, in, in reality, uh, so, 
the first thing here is that we're considering the, the involuntary configurations, as you said, yeah. these two vectors here. So we are defining one of the vectors like uh, considering only the, the, the nuclear basis on top. Now, of course, the, the unfractional molecule by itself is a DA, uh, D6H. So that is really highly symmetric. So nothing should change in principle yeah. when you change it from this. From the, the, the problem arises, the situation here arises from the, 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 the double helix of the thing. Now, the, the main reason here is because, well, first, because of the way the, these angles are defined. Now, suppose that this one here on the top is the, 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 the the cytosine going here. Now this is the unfractional molecule. The problem here is, for example, if you have this conformation like this, that you, you could have like, I don't know, 10 degrees, for example. So this situation in reality is not equivalent to this situation here, which corresponds to, let's call it 170, 169 degrees. So, so yeah, they are not totally, uh, Equivalent exactly because of because of the very geometry of the double helix, also because you have all the nuclear bases here, and then you have the other nuclear bases here. So yeah, this this thing here is definitely not equivalent to this. So that's the reason why you have these two uh, different or different, uh, let's say, um, yeah. probability distributions. So just regarding PDT applications. So you can apply whatever type of light, or it's better to apply light in the UV region or low energy light. I don't know regarding application. So because just thinking about when you analyze all the excited states of antigen, yeah. So you um, yes, for instance, in figure seven country, so you have the which types are charge transfer and all these types. Yeah. So in this type of graph, due to the 10 excited states that you have computed, but for instance, for me, it should be more interesting to see which states are in the range, mm -hmm. energy range, which is important for PDT, because I, I don't mind if I have a charge transfer state in the range of five electron volts. Yeah, so perhaps, would be interesting, I don't know, just to analyze the transitions which are, but I, I don't know, for PDT applications, if it's visible range, I don't know if you know. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think the, the, yeah, the, the absorption spectrum, yeah, I, I think that the, the lowest excitation of contraction is, I mean, it is UV visible, and that it's not that nice of a region. You would a little bit because well, it, it is true that photodynamic therapy has the advantage of being, uh, let's say, localized treatment. But, but still, I mean, what you want to do is you want to you want to activate the photosensitizer. You don't want to create photo damage on just any DNA molecule present in any uh, cell. So uh, so I think you would prefer to go towards, let's say, uh, lower energy, uh, um, yeah, lower energy regions, thanks for the word. Uh, so that you, I mean, a wind, so that you have a window that, that only considers the polar sense factor and now, for example, the, the, the the nearby tissue, so if you want to... Yeah, so for instance, I don't know if it was just that by analyzing the other graph, you, you go, so the spectrum is simulated, you go up to the right <coughs> electron volts, so perhaps it could be nice to, to do an analyze, an analysis of only mm -hmm. of the part of the transitions that are within a spectral range that should be suitable for, for PDT, that's a suggestion. Just to know if, uh, I don't know, the first charge transfer state is really high in energy, so you, you cannot have this type of uh, process. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so just keeping in, uh, in this chapter. So here you study anthracinone and uh, guanine. Mm -hmm. But of course, in DNA, 
it could be also possible to charge transfer from vanillin to oxytocin in this case. So do you think these two processes are competitive or because you have to accept the molecules, let's say. Yeah. So yes, indeed, uh, indeed we, we we could get a more complete picture in by 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 considering uh, also like the guan is the, sorry, the, the cytosine and, uh, partner of, of guan, just because I mean, we know that of course it, it, this was an oversimplification, but we need not expect that the excitation involves exclusively guan and, and fraction. So yeah, you could also have uh, like uh, contributions toward the, towards excited states from from all the nuclear bases. Um, I mean. It, even, even without considering the unpacking of molecule, just, just by considering the excitation, even of a single strand, you could already see the formation of excitants along the yeah. along the single strand. So yeah, we, we could definitely get a more complete picture of the behavior of the of the, of the photosensitizer if we even included uh, more molecules in the uh, more nuclear bases in the in the QM region. Yeah, because no. I don't know, perhaps if you start to include more nuclear bases in the QM, of course you have to move to TDD uh, because otherwise Impossible. So perhaps it could be, I don't know, what do you think? If you find the charge transfer state from one into cytosine, which is lower in energy than the charge transfer state from one into one fraction, so it could be a problem regarding PDT in this case, or? Uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, I mean, in principle, what you want to uh, uh, I mean, what you want to promote is precisely charge transfer that involves the photosensitizer and uh, and uh, and, uh, and then a nuclear base. So uh, it would be problematic because uh, on the relaxation from the excited state, you would prefer to go to the lower energy excited states. So that now, of course, I'm I'm not quite acquainted with with the uh, excited state dynamics, but I I think that uh, yeah, this is something that definitely needs to be to be accounted for okay, okay. so we just to finish because i think we should be quite tired <laughs> <laughs> i have just one curiosity so the last chapter chapter eight uh, you you do a cluster analysis from your simulation how you do this cluster analysis because it's quite interesting because sometimes we have a lot of confirmations and and I think this kind of analysis is quite useful. So, um, so in this case, uh, I think uh, so. What, what what we did was to uh, do a cluster analysis based on the root mean square deviation of the of the of the different infraction model, the the, the infraction derivatives. Uh, no, 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 no. Sorry, it, it was not in that case. What we, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what what we did was uh, to consider a threshold for the root mean square deviation. I'm of course considered a cluster based on the number of well, let's say frames that enter within that uh, uh, within that uh, that. Stabilize the range, let's say. Take one snapshot as the reference and then you compute the standard deviation for the others. So it's just because I'm interested in doing something similar. <laughs> uh, this is something I, I discovered just doing this work, honestly. This is this is really cool. Now, in, in this case, well, what, what you get is like an, an, um, an average structure. Okay. So it's like if you were doing, let's say, statistics, but in, in, in the case of, of, a, uh, of a, a point in 3N space. So, uh, so yeah, you have an average structure, and then you also have well, the, the root mean square deviation associated with this, let's, let's say, standard deviation of, 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 yeah. well, uh, of some kind of matrix, uh, the Euclidean matrix, basically, considering all these, these points in, in, in uh, in R to the 3N. 
So yeah, like the average and the and the, and the standard deviation. So that's that's kind of. And it's done with CPP trash. It is done with CPP trash. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you, Christina. I think I'm the last one to speak. So, uh, so first of all, I, I'm really honored to be here. Not only because of the high quality of the thesis, but also because, and um, primarily because your supervisor, Paco, most people know that was my PhD student more than 10 years back in Santiago de Compostela. So in a way, or scientifically speaking, we're part of the same family. And this is good. <laughs> so uh, with that being said, I guess all the relevant and probably most clever questions have, have been already asked. So this is the good thing of being sharing this session, you know, because you don't need to really uh, ask many questions. And I'm, I'm not going to do that. So just my questions are mainly technical questions or comments or uh, most of them naive questions. So, uh, for instance, at some point of the, of the thesis, you mentioned that it is not possible to describe with analytical force fields, uh, bone breakage formation uh, processes, but that, that is not really uh, true because nowadays it is possible to parameterize reactive uh, force fields. In, obviously, you're not using harmonic potentials, you have to use harmonic potentials probably switching functions and, and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but it is possible. So this is just a, yeah. just that's a comment. Right. And then another comment, just because I'm very picky with these things. In, in equation uh, 2, 177, page 82, uh, the work function, uh, there is, the, the reference energy is missing there. <laughs> you need a reference energy, which is the, the internal energy at zero Kelvin. Of course, it doesn't uh, obviously affect uh, the results because you're, you're, what you're computing is just energy differences. But in a statistical mechanics, you need, you need a reference energy. Yeah. And well, that's just another yeah, problem. Right. Uh, and mm. it is missing in the, in the equation. Mm. And then just a, a curiosity, in, in figure 3.5, page 109, why the error bars for DM, DMI and, the, and DME are so different uh, in page uh, 109. Yeah. You figure, you know, the error bars are completely different, much mm. larger the DME ones. I don't know why. Is there any reason for that? Or? Um, so there. There is indeed a reason. Um, I'm gonna be a little. Uh, I'm gonna be a little bit approximative because honestly, the, 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 this is the paper which, we, uh, which everybody did. So this is this is the the part from from Jesus. I'm not saying it's his fault because on the contrary, he actually did a paper where he actually accounted for it, for these things. So one is DMI, which is the direct Marcus implicit, where you consider implicit solvation. The other one is direct Marcus explicit, where you consider instead explicit solvation. So in those cases, now the main issue there is that uh, let's try to keep this open. Here. Uh, so the main issue there uh, is related to the to, to the very way you are uh, let's say accounting for uh, the well the way you are computing the direct potentials because in, in that situation what you do is you perform dynamics on the oxidized state you perform dynamics on the reduced state and then you consider the vertical excitations in both cases now I, I think it, it is not explain explaining this uh, mobile tools chapter but it is in a, in a paper from from Jesus that was recently published whereby he evidenced um, that whereas in the case of the implicit solvation where you have the, the vertical uh, okay, so, so yeah, you, you have the two dynamics, the dynamic in the, in, the, in the oxidized state and the dynamic in the reduced state. In both cases, you compute vertical excitations, well, vertical, vertical energies, let's say, basically, on top of the geometry. So in the case of implicit solvation, he observed like similar, um, how, do you, how do you call it? Well, Similar energy differences for both cases, whereas in the other case, for uh, one of the trajectories, I don't remember which one, he observed a larger uh, 
energy difference for one situation with respect to, to the other one. So I think the, 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 the larger broadening that the op he obtained for the direct Marcus explicit could be associated with, with these uh, differences here. Yeah. Okay, another question in the same uh, spirit, I mean, another curiosity, in page 113, figure 3.6, uh, the distributions of the different contributions to the, to the energy, why the widths are so different also for the different contributions, is there any simple explanation for that? Uh, this is yeah. This is also something that, that we observed as well uh, in the case of the of the lipid membrane that you had a different uh, width. You, you you asked for the for the widths, right? That yes. They are quite yes. different. Uh, um, I, I honestly I, I'm not entirely sure, but I think in the, in, in the paper from chapter. Well, in the paper that we also did this either with the with the lipid membrane, so so uh, we associated it with the let, let's say with the absolute value of the of the average energy itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but but yeah, I, I think that is a, a quite naive explanation of this fact. That there might be something underlying this mm -hmm. this, this these things, but uh, no. Okay, I think we have to skip page one. So the one. No, well, this is an, an, again another thing. I, I'm not familiar with umbrella sampling, but I just was wondering, for instance, how long does it take to run one simulation with umbrella sampling, for instance, for the permeation through the bilayer? So, in terms, in terms of CPU time, are they either uh, are the simulations costly or are they cheap? How long do they take? Um... They are they are costly. They are they're really really costly. So we we, we run them. We, we we use the Amber software, which has a GPU implementation from PMMD. Uh, so let's say that on average, for for these systems, you could get like, uh, so let's say in, in in this case, so we had like thirty nanoseconds per window. No, back here. So you perform a, a let's say in this case, so a, a 30 nanosecond simulation for each one of the of the windows. Now I think we have, I suppose, 64 windows here, mm -hmm. and we also computed the opposite side of the of the permeation. I, I did not show it here, but, but there is also there. So uh, a 30 nanosecond simulation that could take like well, let's say 10 to 12 hours. Mm -hmm. The 30 nanoseconds for the GPU, then multiply it by 64, by 2, so multiply, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say 10 hours. 10 hours by uh, times 128, that would be uh, 12,800 hours for getting uh, this free energy profile, more or less. Mm -hmm. But there is a really important thing. Uh, um, yeah, but, I mean, the, the, the main issue here would be, okay, if you have one GPU and you're running the simulation on one GPU, yeah, you would run the entire simulation, uh, let's say, serial from the beginning mm -hmm. to the end. Yes. So that would be a total of, yeah, like, uh, it, 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 I, I might be messing up the computational times, but yeah, like 12,800 12, hours, which is, well, I don't know, like 10% of the computational time we have in the CCC, more or less. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, but the calculations are sequential. You cannot mm -hmm. parallelize. parallelize in, in reality, you can. You know, if you have a nice GPU cluster, like the one that Juanjo has, mm -hmm. you can parallelize them. Yeah, so you can compute different windows. So, so and then one last question uh, again on, on umbrella sampling because I, I thought umbrella sampling provides only with uh, thermodynamic information, but uh, it seems that it is also capable of predicting kinetics because you calculate the fusion coefficients yeah. with umbrella sampling. I didn't know that, but uh, then you mentioned in the, in the in the in the thesis that you employ one method and then you you give a reference here at 325. I went to the reference. 
and they talk about two different methods to calculate the diffusion coefficient. So I was wondering which one you employ in particular, because they uh, they talk about two different methods. I forgot the names. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I gotta be honest. I don't not remember the names either of the okay. methods, but but uh, yeah, the, it was one in which they yeah. they. Yeah, they, they, they uh, you calculate per permeability coefficient from the PMF and also the yeah. diffusion coefficient. And, and I'm talking about the method, the specific method employed to, 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 to determine the uh, diffusion coefficient, because the PMF was already explained in the thesis. Yeah. yeah. Okay, never mind. So I think I, I'm done with my, with my questions. And, and now I think it is the moment in which I have to ask if anybody in the audience or uh, anybody uh, among the people who are joining us uh, via Zoom, any doctor wants to ask uh, a question to, to, to Gustavo, now is the moment to, to ask the question. Is anybody? No, as usual. <laughs> so, if that is the case, then I have to kindly ask you to, to, to leave the room because we now need some time for deliberation and mm -hmm. decide the range of this thesis, so I need some few minutes to, to do that. So please. I want to stop the broadcast yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>